Fantasy Desk uh, concert and conversation live stream. And I'm super excited to have with me today Jacob Sayer. Hello, Jacob. Hey, Mike. How you Hi. doing? Good. How are you? Good. I'm feeling pretty good today. Nice. We've already had this conversation off camera, but you know. We did. I mean, why not? Why not rehash it? I like. I like e this. Exactly. Um, <laughs> just uh, while Jacob shares the stream and stuff, um, just for everyone watching, please let us know if the audio levels are strange. I know in the past I've been too loud compared to the guest, so. If anything's weird, tell me. And um, yeah, please smash that like and hit that share button and um, check out the links to all of Jacob's music and stuff. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, I know Jacob because we studied at the same time in Vancouver many years ago. Well, not many years ago, but a few years ago. Like three, three years ago. Three years is like approaching Many, many to my perspective it's, it's I, I guess several years ago let's say several years yeah and so um yeah we met in grad school there uh doing a master's in in vancouver at ubc with daniel bolshoi uh and you know we've stayed in touch over the years and i've always admired jacob's direction his music all that he's about so um when you're ready jacob if you could just give us a brief summary of how you see your artistic yeah, share, output share, share, share. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. we'll do. <laughs> Let's see. I think I've shared it to like <laughs> as many groups as I can. Maybe ten, ten groups or something. Nice. The first, the first ten, uh, the first minute of this is just going to be Jacob being distracted on his phone. Exactly. Oh, Joy uh, Rayan says the audio sounds good. Thank you, Joy. That's oh, hey, good. Joy. Um, so, students. can you give us the Cliff Notes version of your background, or or just about your art, your artistic output, what you're doing now before you play us something? So my artistic output as of now has more to do with composition and transcription. Two years ago, I released a full length, my first full length album uh, entitled Migration, and I toured around with that a little bit. And since then, I have mostly been focusing on, on transcribing the music on that album. And then I was hired in the fall to transcribe the music of a guitarist in Norway named Espen Jorgensen. And uh, his album on the Great Alkali Plains is super beautiful, um, very folksy, but also kind of along the lines of the finger style of music that I'm playing and that everybody is, you know, everybody in my world really loves. And um, it's 45 minutes of music and I finished it uh, last Friday, actually. Nice. So yeah, I'm just like, I spent, I've spent a good six months transcribing about a hundred pages of, of music and I just, man, I'm so happy to be done with it. And I, I love the project and I learned a lot of cool music throughout of it. So like, um, I've been mostly focusing on the internal work, you know, kind of the backbone of, of the musical world. Now I'm really excited to kind of get back to writing again and, um, performing more and stuff. I guess, yeah, performing, performing a little bit more, doing more of these live streams, kind of, kind of following your, following your lead on the, on the uh, live streaming and the uh, content building model. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what I've been up to recently, mostly mostly transcription and teaching and um, that kind of stuff. But earlier, um, maybe last fall, I was I was finally getting back into writing some new music and then I got then I got hired cool. on for this job. And yeah. we should, I guess for context, since this stream has been basically like classical guitar focused for a long time, I mean, we, I mentioned that we did a degree together at UBC, so you are a classically trained guitarist. You have a master's and a bachelor's, but your direction has changed a little bit, right? Like, so how would you describe what you write and what you play to people who are familiar with classical guitar, but maybe not so familiar with the style that you, you play in and work in? So to those who are familiar with classical guitar, I would describe the music that I right now as sort of a hybrid of modern classical music and contemporary fingerstyle guitar music. And when you say contemporary fingerstyle guitar, it's just such a such a broad term. And what I like to try to condense it down into is maybe, oh uh, man, so many different styles. I don't know, man. I, I mean, I take influence from modern jazz. I take influence from like prog metal. I take influence from uh, the classical music that I studied. It's really hard. I don't know, it's really hard to describe it, but essentially yeah. it's just solo acoustic guitar music with influences from um, many different modern styles of music and, and traditional traditional musics too. Can it, like you said, I was um, bachelor's and master's for, you know, I studied, I studied classical guitar for seven years, but before that I was more into the finger style stuff anyway. And the metal stuff. 
Yeah, I, I never got over it. I'm still into it. Just the other day, I was skating all around Vancouver, and I had it in my ear, Animals as Leaders, and Chan, and Covet, and it's, that's less metal, I guess, but still prog guitar stuff, you know, just nerdy guitar stuff. That's, yeah. you know what, that's probably how I would describe my music. This is nerdy guitar music. Nerdy guitar but, stuff, nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what we're all about on the stream, so that's good. It's okay if you have a bit broader definition of nerdy guitar stuff than just classical nerdy guitar stuff, you know, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I try to. I think. I think the interesting thing about writing this kind of music after going through um, so much schooling is staying so conscious of what we learned and wondering what my colleagues like you and my mentors and my um, just my peers will will think about the music that I'm writing. So when I'm writing it, I'm always thinking about you guys and kind of like what what kind of comments we would have for each other and how we would uh, maybe articulate certain voices differently or how we would even think about counterpoint and things like that so I'm always when I'm writing I'm always thinking pretty pretty theoretically um, mm -hmm. but I, I think the reason I'm kind of drifting in the direction that I'm drifting is because I, I have more of a sort of gut feel about the you know the improvisation that, that I'm after here you know what I mean yeah um, Devin says ner nerdy guitar stuff <laughs> uh, I'm sure Devin gets enough of the nerdy guitar stuff comments, Devin. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's cool. I mean, I, I, you know, without getting without getting on like a super long ideological rant before playing because we want to hear you play something. I, I do think the barrier between classical music and other music needs to be like questioned a lot, especially well, especially for guitar, but in all instruments. And I just think like being classically trained gives you a lot of tools, you know. And so it's not to knock it mm -hmm. because you get you get like you said you get tools about contemporary uh, sorry counterpoint articulation dynamics, all sorts of things that a lot of other genres of guitar people don't consider. And so like for me, a, a, a guitarist that impresses me is someone like Tosin Abasi or someone like yeah. even Tim Henson, as much as people don't like Polyphia, someone like that who takes advantage of all those aspects of music that I'm intimately aware of because of being classically trained, but are within other genres too. So I think that's, you know, it's, it's totally like appropriate to be thinking about those no matter what style of music you're doing. Well, same same as what you prefaced before. I don't want to get to because I could we could talk about this for the next two and a half hours, which I'm sure we will. But I think the most interesting thing about what's happening today is that music is just so accessible to everyone now. You know, everyone has a Spotify account. Everyone can get on YouTube for free and just dig dig their rabbit holes and find find classical musicians that inspire them. And there are so many un I don't want to say. There's so many there's so many people out there, so many guitarists and musicians who aren't classically trained that take so much influence from classical musicians. And that's just this nice kind of like meet in the middle kind of, mm -hmm. you know, fusion. Well, and there's many areas of musicians. I mean, there's many types of guitar playing that where people are better at certain aspects of music than generally classical guitarists are, which we can take from. Definitely. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Lucas Bezzetto says, can I steal nerdy guitar stuff as the name of my album? Have you trademarked that yet, Jacob? No. How about it? How about it's it? It's yours. We're just giving we'll, away we'll all, we'll all release a series of albums called Nerdy Guitar Stuff. Yeah. That sounds like what we would do anyways. Um, so can you yeah. play us something? Or what are you going to play us? One of your tunes? Yeah. So um, I'm going to start out with something in standard tuning. Whoa. Which... Bold. <laughs> I think that was my goal when I was writing my album a couple of years ago is like I wanted to start the album off with something in standard because I don't know just because there's so many different tunings out there I just wanted to yeah actually try composing something in standard I actually haven't played this one in a while as I said I've been kind of um, transfixed with the transcription so uh, I just started working these two tunes up yesterday so nice. hopefully they uh, they go smoothly cool and what are they called this says a pair of tunes called uh, Textures and Bloom. And they're, oh, you know, one of my previous guests, guests had a piece called Bloomed, Evan Toucher. Oh, no way. Yeah, you should go check out his piece. Maybe you can, you can do a collab or something. Um, Evan Toucher? Yeah, Evan Toucher, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, awesome. my God, I, got, I love that guy. He's such a, such a good player. Yeah. Okay, so Textures and Bloom. And um, I'm just going to turn my camera and audio off here, and we'll hear you play these tunes. Right on.
See, on the album, it's a seamless transition, but what I didn't tell anybody is that there's a tuning in the middle. Story of my life. I'm not even going to tell the tuning joke. I'm not even going to do it. Thanks. Nice work. It's so weird to set applause, right? I'll just give him like like a little tiny applause yeah. from through my head. Is that the Triforce on your wrist? No, no, no. It's uh, it's the Deathly Hallows. Oh, that's okay. That's it's a triangle. It's it's okay. Just as nerdy. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Nice. I um nice. I was definitely hearing some like some of the like um more serene Animals as Leaders tracks. I was hearing some of the that kind of harmony in the first piece. Oh yeah, those those little crunchy chords. Yeah. Yeah, they're the kind of chords whenever Tosin writes like a, a like slower, more soupy riff, you know. He always yeah. Uses those. Yeah, I just love it. I mean, it's it kind of always harkens back to the uh, the cross string scales, kind of. I mean. Yeah. When you're, when you're, I, you're, I love cluster chords. chords like that. You have the option to play kind of arpeggio. You have like arpeggio technique, but you still have the option to play melodies within that chord. So it's kind of. Yeah. Kind of an 
it's nice. A very effective technique on the guitar for sure. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that writing about for writing about um, like writing on guitar that's difficult for non guitarist composers. So I'm doing like a whole research project on this right now is like how guitarists and composers work together. Is that it's not yeah. intuitive on the guitar how like certain melodies fit within a harmony across the strings in like an easy to play way, you know, it's Yeah. Yeah. No, it's absolutely true. I mean when I'm even arranging for guitar, I mean when you hear an orchestral piece or a piano piece which seems texturally pretty straightforward you're like yeah i can play that on the guitar no problem but your hands have to do like all these twisty crazy things you have to hit, place hinge bars back behind your position and it just yeah yeah it's it's a strangely difficult thing to do but it's a good thing to study for sure you're you're doing the research project on it yeah just on the how guitarists and composers collaborate so different ways to do it if well in all cases actually i'm looking at both composers who are guitarists and composers who are not guitarists but obviously the kind of the topic is the difference between those because it's a pretty big difference <laughs> yeah yeah Surprise. well what are you finding <laughs> Sorry. yeah what what kinds of um what kind of uh specific routes are you are you taking uh, that's really interesting oh i'm just interviewing people and then comparing all the results essentially i'm gonna make like a documentary type thing about it but anyways this oh, interview awesome. is about you jacob you I'll always find a way to turn it around. Yeah, I know you will. Um, so I guess you kind of already described your background, um, but how, like, it seems like your work is made up of a lot of different things. I'm amazed at with people who can compose, perform, teach, record. Like, how do you balance it all? Because I don't feel like that's possible. <laughs> uh, I'm not always healthy, if that kind of answers your question. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's an obs it's it's I'm sure you know that it's it's an obsession when you when you find something that you love and that you're pretty good at or that you know that you can be pretty good at. Um, you want you want to find ways to dive into as many avenues of it as you can. And right. when I was in college the first time, you know, kind of like I told you earlier, I grew I, I mean, I don't think I told you, but I grew up a musician, right? I was a drummer by the time I was five years old and went through you know a punk band and a, an emo band and uh, all this other stuff and i was just always obsessed with playing and i wanted to pursue music professionally and even during my degree i was trying to do my classical studies and my finger style kind of interest and you know my nails would get wrecked and i'd come in and dr noonan would just be super like pissed about it because my nails were just chipped up from the steel string and but anyway, I, um, I've always been trying to juggle what I like and what I know is kind of good for me, um, if, that, if that makes sense. I, I love classical guitar, but it is kind of, um, for, my, for my purposes, it's kind of a means to an end, which is I enjoy playing this music, but I, I am more interested in, in, in learning from the composition techniques and what I can do with my hands. And, and even that process of, of dissecting a piece of music trains you a lot in how to multitask in, in everyday life but just because it's a mentality I think I, I, I feel like when I'm uh, trying to balance teaching when I'm trying to balance recording and composing and transcription it's sometimes it feels like I'm working 18 hour days well it doesn't feel like it's because I am sometimes I'm working yep. 18 hour days I know that feeling um, yeah and then you just go you go you go and you burn out and you're like okay well how productive was i this week and how healthy am i now and usually the the scale is tipped in one direction or another and so it, i don't know for for me right now i i don't have like an an, an answer to that because i'm still kind of trying to figure out where my balance is at right even after um i finished a, this major transcription project last week i i was like what what am i what do i do now it's like i don't have I don't know, it's just like you focus so much of your time on one thing and when you finish, you're just kind of like, it's like post-project blues and you just kind of like, right. you know what I mean? So, I don't know, I'm, I'm always trying to find find some semblance of balance. Uh, it's hard, I, I, that's that's what I got, it's, it's just tricky, but it's fun, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean, I just like, that's part of the reason I haven't composed, not because I don't have any desire to, but just like, well, I don't have that much of a desire, probably less than you do, because I think for some people, um, I'm sure for some people, like, like 
such as you, you have to compose kind of at some point, right? Like it's just something yeah. that has to happen. For me, I feel like it's something that I could do one day because I find it really interesting, and maybe I would develop a, a habit of composing. You know, if you could say that. Yeah. But yeah. um, but at the same time, it's kind of like it's just it's one more hat to wear, and as a musician, like you have to wear so many hats. You know, as a professional, yeah. especially a freelance professional, like if you're an orchestral musician, it's a grueling job. Don't get me wrong, but they have kind of like one hat, and they just have to be really good in that hat. You know. Yeah. I mean, that's not true entirely either. There are orchestral musicians that do stuff on the side or need to do stuff on the side for various reasons. Yeah, yeah, but I, I know what you're saying. I mean, I feel I've always I've always put this stigma on myself as a guitarist, and I've, I've noticed this other that other guitarists do this, which is, like, we, we, we're, kind of, we're kind of lone wolves, especially classical guitarists in a way. I mean, we, we're lucky to have, like, the Guitar Society and, like, a community of, of other classical guitarists but even then that's a pretty niche world right and we're Super all niche. most of us are soloists and some of us are in duos and some of us are in chamber music projects but for the most part our projects are relatively small and i think um because of that we have to we have to teach to earn a living and I'm, i think there are a lot of guitarists out there who are skilled enough to obviously make a living off of performing but even then i'm sure they're going to end up teaching at some point yeah it's and not sustainable like it's just not it's hard point. yeah it's not really sustainable and yeah anyways i yeah that's a topic we could go on for a long time but i know what you mean yeah, yeah. um crash course for the wind has some great comments here first i'm hearing of the stealth retuning between tracks i want my money back well Jacob, <laughs> you're gonna have to re issue a refund for your album i think uh um, 20 bucks i got gotcha. you 20 bucks and then they all said that's when you need Nev devin to lock you in a room with some chips and netflix <laughs> that would be my cousin matt i bet yeah probably i i've um yeah sometimes that's, oh, I, part, that's partly why you need a partner too because sometimes your partner can be like hey you need to take a break because you're gonna drive me crazy you know <laughs> let me tell you about that i'm just gonna give a i'm gonna first of all find your find your live stream so i can open up the on youtube yeah i i i feel is like it on youtube or is it on facebook YouTube right now facebook, but I, i'm thankful that i have a partner who helps me rest sometimes you know i think as a musician, yeah thank god need... thank god for jessica and Devin, man yeah. i because i uh was telling you about that unhealthy balance that I had and I'm just gonna put this down I can't do two things at once man yeah such as the topic of our conversation I think doing multiple things at once but I uh I was trying to do this transcription project and as you know transcription is super time consuming and you know it's cool and I really like it but doing transcription teaching trying to practice my own music and and trying to build content because we're in a time right now where it's really important to do that and well and we're also in an industry where unfortunately you have to make a lot of free content up front and there's no way around that like i know some people fight against it but i'm just kind of like you know what this is the reality now with the internet and so you either sink or swim basically i think i think if you're good at something don't do it for free is it's kind of it's kind of not really super I, applicable yeah. in, in most cases here. I think, I think. it's true but. to an extent, probably with certain things, but yeah, there's a balance there too to have. But I just mean like the yeah. online content thing is kind of like a necessary evil now. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I like it because it's low stakes, right? I think right. Um, I'll get back to my shout out to Devin here in a sec. But it's low stakes because I mean, at first I was really cynical towards Instagram and posting on Facebook because I was like, I don't have time to do that uh, all the time because I'm, I'm the kind of perfectionist like a lot of people out there who will sit there for half an hour to get a 45 second clip, you know, just doing right. take after take, trying to get it perfect. You just need to care less, Jacob. I did exactly what I did. I started yes. giving fewer, fewer craps about it and then I just like, all right, I'm practicing this tune. I'll set my camera up and I'll just take a, take a quick pic of me practicing this tune. And then I'll, I'll post it up, it'll take five minutes, and I'll continue practicing. And that's not to say that I don't still have days. Like, just the other day I posted something, and it took me half an hour to get something that I was so comfortable with. It's that red light syndrome, you know? I don't, yeah. I don't know. But So, yeah, I mean, in that regard, I think Instagram can be can be pretty low stakes, you know? I mean, you, you can put up imperfect stuff, and people actually kind of connect with it a little bit more, and I, I really like that. I really appreciate right. that. I appreciate the online thing, too, in the sense that I know – when you put something out and people it's obviously people really enjoy it. you start to realize too your imposter syndrome you know like you kind of get over that a bit more because you kind of like you start getting the feedback from people it's like when you play a concert and people i mean if you're really 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 hard on yourself you may not believe it but when people tell you oh i really enjoyed it and you, you can tell they mean it then it kind of helps yeah. you get over your own like you know yeah, well, I think that's what's so important about what you're doing with this and what we're all trying to do with sharing our content is it 
so and, and a, a good a good friend of mine sean hall who's in bellingham right now uh just released a finger cell guitar album not too long ago has been posting videos of his process of writing a new song he'll have a he'll have a lick and he'll just um kind of get 10 minutes or 15 minutes on and be like okay well i'm kind of thinking about this part of the lick and what i want to go underneath it and all that and he'll just kind of show his process of writing because he believes that the polished product is great and all but it's i think i think it's just really exciting for for everyone to kind of see the behind the scenes of things too and so yeah. I, I think yeah i think in that regard it's it's really nice that we're all sharing our content um at, at kind of a in kind of a low stakes way and there obviously is there's there's like the premium stuff which which is nice for people to pay for but um you know it's just it's it's music man it's just it's nice to share yeah for sure there's there's a big upside and a big downside i think to it all yeah but i was finishing up that project last week i'd been working like 10 12 14 hour days and you know you get yourself into a, a routine and you wake up you work you take a break to eat lunch you keep working and then it's like okay maybe at the end of the day you you watch a movie and it's it's all good but um, that cycle's hard to break and uh, after I finished that project I was like I don't know I just feel like I need to, to, to keep doing something to like wean myself off of the workload and Deb was like no I'm gonna lock you in the back room you're gonna watch Netflix all day I'm gonna bring you snacks and that's that's all I did I was in the back room for like eight solid hours just watching I think I was watching The Last Dance which is that um, documentary about the Chicago Bulls in the 90s oh cool yeah and I because I was a kid when that was happening and I was like super obsessed with it so it was, it was, that was pretty fun but yeah, I mean it's it's so it's so important to take a break, man. And and when you're in the middle of um, when you're in the middle of your your work life, it's it's hard to tell to tell yourself that because you you feel like you don't have time, you know. Yeah, for sure. I um, it's really important to have that balance, and we always need people around us who help us help remind us of that, you know. Yeah, it can be a pretty isolating job. Yeah, yeah in some ways, for sure. I mean, chamber music helps. Um, do you play yeah. any chamber music now, or not so much? No, I don't. Um, I did when I was in school, and with Kyle Hawks. Uh, yeah, I played. I played some chamber music with Kyle. I played some chamber music with uh, violin quartet. Had with JP. cello, right? Too. With cello, yeah. Angela Kim. I played um, uh, the Radame Natali Sonata for guitar. Yeah, that's and it was one. super duper fun. I mean, and that's just kind of the thing. Like, whenever you get another instrument involved and you get another uh, consciousness into your your musical making, it's it's just super fun to explore the timbres that you can create to with with each other and kind of the, and have the just another instrument. human there for rehearsal. I mean, come on, like yeah, yeah. Practicing by yourself all the time gets exhausting. I'm an extrovert though, right. so that's me, but. Well, yeah, no, I'm the same way. Because when you start practicing by yourself and you start picking apart your own stuff, it's like, well, now you got to put it all back together. But you're almost, you're most of the time your own worst enemy, and you're just like every single thing you can pick apart, you're picking apart. And so it's it's nice to it's nice to play chamber music and and realize that it's it's not as big of a deal as you think it is. You know, <laughs> it being like your your minuscule minuscule kind of mistakes you issues, know? yeah, or or yeah. see the things that another musician notices that you're not noticing that are big are a bigger issue maybe than like your buzz note or something you know like for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> like our, our overarching phrasing or something like the way a cellist phrases their music oh my god it was so inspiring to like apply that to that piece you know i mean yeah chamber music is super important yeah man the piece that kyle and i played was was good but it was the really Ravel, tricky. right it was the Ravel and the brower do you remember the triptico oh yeah triptico that piece is crazy yeah it was really cool but it was really tough yeah, that yeah Ravel, I mean, I he, love that reveal. That's yeah. I gotta pull that one back out again because there are some licks in there that you call them licks, phrases, turns, whatever, motifs, riffs, licks, riffs, hot, hot riffs. I'm a guitarist, I can't stay away from it. Yeah. No, I don't know. But no, there there are some phrases in there, some motives in there that feel so good to play. And it, obviously, some of it's really tricky. But I learned how to do cross string scale, uh, tr cross string trills with that piece. Or you learned how to improve them. I mean, you knew how to do them before, but yeah, there some of the cross string oh, yeah. trills in that are insane yeah no it was really fun yeah super fun cool okay my gotcha question of the stream that i ask everybody even though you're not playing classical guitar very much right now how do you define classical guitar oh oh no i'm a bad i'm a bad friend and i haven't watched your streams enough to know that that was a question <laughs> ah well that's good because then it can surprise you what a surprise how do i is that is that just the the scope of the question how do i define classical guitar yep Hang you need to open your beer for this. Yeah, exactly. What beer is this? Oh, I think uh, I recognize the label. Beer, by the way, sorry. 
Big shout out to 33 Acres. Oh, you ever I been love there? 33 Acres. I miss 33 Acres. So good. Their best beer. I'm thinking about the question, but their best beer isn't in, in bottle form. So I'm I'm drinking their their California Common. It's a lager. It's cool. So tasty. 33 Acres is the is the one of the best in the in the area. Yeah, I love it. So, uh, without thinking about this too hard, um. I don't know. I'm just gonna start talking, and I'm just gonna kind of pluck out some some issues and some some things I like about it, and see see what comes out, and see if I can land on a maybe. On a if you had to answer. explain it to someone who didn't know what it was but knew like about sort of music generally, how would you describe it? Well, classical guitar is instrumental guitar music from. I would say I would say maybe historical instrumental guitar music. Okay. If well, I had what to about like contemporary classical guitar, or is that sort of like a, an exception? I think contemporary classical guitar is tricky for people to understand, and that was part of what I was going to start riffing on a minute ago, is because I think when we start talking about classical guitar, we're thinking about, we, you and I are thinking about the entire scope, including what's happening now. And yes. yeah. I think when most, you're, I, I think when your average listener thinks about classical music, they think about you know the big guys, the big guns, Mozart, Beethoven, Debussy. If they're you know really into it, maybe Rachmaninoff, and you know, and, and even even deeper than that, I mean, classical music has a certain feel to it, and it's because I don't know the old dead the old dead white guy syndrome is like it's still pretty pervasive in in that world. But I think when we're talking about um, like when you and I are talking about classical guitar, if I were to describe classical guitar to a new student who wanted to learn classical guitar, I would, I would just give them a lot to listen to, and um, I would throw them into the gauntlet of contemporary music and um, try to include as much variance as possible. Know, this is, this is, this is tricky, yeah, but I'm, I would try to include as, as much as possible without overwhelming them and throwing them into something as, as rough as the um, the Jose Sonata or the... Why am I forgetting? I can't believe I'm forgetting this. Oh, the, the yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wouldn't want to throw them directly into that, right? That would scare them off, but that's kind of... I, well, you know what I mean? That's kind of the tricky thing. For the length. I mean the length of the Jose Sonata, but it is quite listenable. Otherwise, I think like a movement or something, you know. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, it's one of my. It was one of the first like major guitar solo guitar pieces that I kind of became obsessed with. I never played it, unfortunately, but. Yeah, I thought about trying it, but then I was like, screw that. Um, <sighs> yes, it's a that's so much work. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. Um, although I'm playing some pieces this year that are similar, but. Uh, yeah, anyways, sounds like I, it. I think the. That's why I think the ca category of classical guitar is like the most problematic. I think it's problematic in a lot of ways. I mean, most categories are problematic in a lot of ways, but this one, first, because of like, I think the primary reason it's problematic for the average person who hears that, like those two words, classical guitar, is because, like you said, they think Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, etc. We do have transcriptions of Bach, um, but you know. Most of our repertoire is most of our repertoire that is commonly played. Let's say we have a lot of nineteenth century, eighteenth century repertoire, but it's not actually that commonly played. And most of the repertoire that's commonly played is from the twentieth century, and the late nineteenth century, and the and the, and the contemporary, like you know, last 20, 30 years. So it's kind of problematic because, like you said, there's a whole different concept that we classical guitarists think of when we say it, that includes a lot more diversity actually than mm. the concept that m the general public has of classical music and guitar. But then I think a lot of them don't even know how to connect the guitar to classical music, you know? I, I was gonna mention that too, because I think when you were talking about contemporary music being the bulk of our what most of us play, I think it's because we all, m I would say the majority of us, at least in North America, grew up with like classic rock and punk rock and guitar music that was very shreddy, or even if it was acoustic guitar music, folk, folk music and stuff like that, I think when you grow up with the guitar as your primary instrument, which I think a lot of a lot of people gravitate towards, it's y y your perception of the guitar is is mostly popularized. And when we start talking about classical guitar, if yeah, I, I've I've noticed that. Like when I say classical guitar to somebody who is just kind of a general music listener, they're like, I'm not really sure 
what that means. Yeah, and because they're trying to think, like, have to is have there, have I heard any conversation. Guitar, like, Beethoven pieces that have guitar in it? You know, and they can't think of any, of course, because there are none. Except yeah, exactly. Like, like, if they say Mozart, Beethoven, I'm like, ah, oh, that'd be a yeah. hell of a time to play. I mean, we Beethoven. have Giuliani and stuff, I guess. I'm also a little bit biased in the fact that I don't really love the, like, classical period in general, but especially the classic. Yeah. Anyways, Same. I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. I'm playing the Grand <laughs> Overture right now. So in my defense, I'm playing some Giuliani this year, and I'm loving it. Okay? So Proud of you, Mike. So my obligatory, like, classical yeah. century. I will say I, I loved playing the Merits Fantasy. Like, yeah. playing some Merits is, is usually pretty fun. That's more, like, romantic, though. The romantic period, I can get yeah, a lot more fair. behind than the – well, personally, for my taste. I think this is just a me thing. Like, it's not that the music from before then is not good. It's just – yeah. Well, how do you feel years. about classifying Soar as a romantic period oh, composer? I don't, I don't know enough about Soar to say. Well, have you heard enough of his music, I guess? Yeah, I would think of it as more classical than romantic. Yeah, I think that's kind of the interesting thing. I mean, he, he was a romantic period composer, but composed in a classical style, right? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's the of... other problem with these categories. It's like those Hopstock pieces I was telling you about, like the Hopstock Alan Wilcox piece I'm playing. He made up a fictional composer, wrote in the style of, of you know, early 20th century French impressionistic music, and, like, do we classify that as, like, early 20th century modern music, or do we classify it as contemporary, like, 21st century music, you know? I don't know. Um, I, would, yeah. I would tend towards putting it in the category of Debussy and Ravel, because it sounds like that, it's meant to sound like that, I don't know, it's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and if that was the composer's intention, then who are we to tell him he's wrong? You know, yeah. Yeah. I think the one the the thing I always think back to is when we were studying when you you Joel Kyle and I were studying Joaquin Rodrigo's. Um, don't let me forget this piece. Oh my God, it's the difference between the B natural and the B flat. Yeah, yeah. What what is that piece? How come I'm forgetting that piece right now? Uh, the um, the Invocación de Danza. The Invocación, yeah, the Invocación. Uh, and we're like we're all talking about it we're all discussing it we have a week where we're just like heavy like should it be this because of the context surrounding it or should it be be flat and then we find out that Joaquin is like who cares do what you want it doesn't matter like yeah it's, I just think that's kind of the interesting thing I think the composer's intention is what matters and a lot of time we we spend a lot of time kind of squabbling over not that not that's that kind of research is squabbling, I guess, but it can be squabbling. It can turn into squabbling. It can be, yeah. yeah. It definitely can be. And I think um that's what draws me to um that's what draws me to composing in the first place is there's a certain freedom in, in the music that you play. And obviously there's a discipline too, but that also is what blurs the line of what what is classical guitar and what is fingerstyle guitar and what is rock and what is pop and what is yeah it's hard what is genre you know what is what is the genre of music that you're playing and the, and the problem is that we have to we have to classify these things to help um, our students understand and to help our audiences understand what we're yeah, what yeah. we're doing and, and make, be kind help of our quick, bio make sense you know? and et cetera. Yeah. Although I, I like just calling myself a guitarist lately I'm like you know yeah like it's, that's the best. Quick, you know? quick draw. Then they can ask, "What music do you play?" And I can say, "Well, I like to play this kind of music. I like to play this kind of music." You know? um, yeah, you got to start them off easy. Yeah, Kevin Lowe. Do you know Kevin? Kevin who? Kevin Lowe. He's a Singaporean guitarist. He's saying the general use of the term classical in classical music is already somewhat misused anyway. But the great thing is we get to explore with the guitar is the vers versatility of switching between lots of genres. True nice. statement. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Kevin. Uh, and as Michael mentioned, yeah, concept of classical guitar is easily an oxymoron to some people. Yeah, I mean, it's just really foreign to a lot of people. And unfortunately, we have to, like, find a way to explain it in some situations. And it's tricky. It's hard. And I think as soon as it's, it's funny, too, because as soon as you play what you would consider to be a classical piece, if, for example, I played The Merit's Fantasy for someone, you'd be like, oh, it sounds so Spanish and so lovely. Like, yeah, as soon as like, you uh, play, like... This is depressing. Yeah, as soon as you play music. anything on the classical nylon string guitar, it's automatically Spanish guitar. Like I, I don't know, just that's yeah, a thing. It's mm -hmm. it's a tr it's tricky, but you also don't want to like discourage people from like trying to make a connection because that's true. God knows we don't need to be more pretentious. Yeah, I as, have a I have a tendency towards being that way sometimes. <laughs> I think that probably we need a little bit more approachability. Anyways, um, yeah, you're right. Maybe I yeah okay. We're gonna play our 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 um, token game on this show. You ready, Jacob? Speaking of, classical uh, I, guitar, I think I think so. Um, and if the audience has any questions for us throughout, please uh, write them in the comments because we're happy to take questions. 
Okay, so we're going to play the repertoire listening game, which I, I think you've seen a few times now. I have. Okay, so just for the audience. That one sake, I've seen. There's going to be, there's gonna be um, I'm going to play some tracks, and Jacob is going to try to guess the piece, the composer, and the player. Um, and in the cases where it is both the composer and the player are the same person or people, you can guess the album, okay? Oh, nice, nice twist. Okay, um, and right. this one's going to be a slightly different than normal on this show because I know Jacob's musical tastes, and so I tried to make it interesting. Um, so we'll see, but we'll see if anyone else uh, picks up on some of the differences here too. Um, and you have there's a beginner category, intermediate category, and advanced. So I tried to make them like somewhat safe. So there's three oh, points excited. per piece: piece, composer, player. Three points. You can get a total of twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Yeah. Equally excited and nervous, maybe more nervous. We'll Equally see. excited and nervous. That's the way we like it. Okay. Number numero uno. Oh, oh, oh. Is anything coming through to you or no? Yeah, protest the hero. Wait, no, you got it from that? <laughs> from like those two seconds? I don't think that the audience is going to hear it though because it wasn't coming through. <sighs> One second. Here we go. One moment. You're I'm already right. hearing the rest of the song in my head. I just got to remember. Oh, okay, I've got it working now. So this is the track. Protest the Hero, Fortress. Fortress the Hero, Fortress. And what's the song? Oh, no. I'm ashamed that I can't just think. You know the, you know the riffs. Uh, maybe maybe so hearing some of the vocals will help. Goddess Bound? No, it's not Goddess Bound. I'll give you two more guesses. Okay. Uh, here, this. Uh, so, so heavy. Okay, what's, what's the song? Oh no, Mike. I know we both love Protest the Hero, so I had to put one Protest the Hero track on it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Protest the Hero, Fortress. Oh my god, I, I can't believe it. for the song. Limb from Limb. No, no. Limb from Limb. Not it either. You're thinking more because of the lyrics there to tear her yeah. head from her shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> um, wretch? Wretch, you got it. It's Wretch. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh so, so good. Nice. Three out of three. Very good, Jacob. Thank you. Okay. That was a, that was a relatively easy one. Track number like, two. Track number two will go a little more back to our listeners' usual tastes, I think. <laughs> Joaquin Rodrigo, yeah. Sonata Giacosa. Sonata Giacosa, correct. Movement uh, three. Movement three, yeah, you got it. I mean, you don't have to mention the movement. If you got the sonata, I think that's good enough. And who's the player? I can give you some let's hints. Let's hear. Sorry? Yeah, let's, we can I hear again. I'll give you some hints, too. This is a French player. Is it Gabriel? No, Gabriel Bianco? Gabriel Bianco. You have one more guess. Although he is also a GFA winner. Oh, uh, um, I'm thinking about him. I can picture him in my head. Um, <laughs> Picturing in your head is not good enough. It's not good enough. Let me let me think about this for a second. Um, I think Kyle's quite a fan of this player. The guy I'm, this is not the guy I'm picturing in my head, but I'm going to throw him out there. Is it Thomas Villato? No, it's Jeremy Jouvet. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have, I, that's not who I was picturing, but I, I can uh, see that now. Yes, it's Jeremy I was Jouvet. thinking those, those downward scales were just so crispy and so clean that it was, um, I can't remember the name. He released a CD with a uh, cellist who... Oh, Thibaut Garcia. Yeah, I was thinking of Thibaut. Uh, Thibaut's great. But it's not Tebow. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's Jeremy Jouvet. He has a whole CD of um, Rodrigo. The, the, the Tona Diaz on it also. Ooh, I'll check that played, out. If you remember. I do remember. That was super fun. That, yeah, was, that a good, was a good that piece. Time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like, I think I'll also say before we go on to the next piece that those, um, those crunchy chords that were bouncing back and forth between you guys were super inspiring for me when I was writing music. I was just like, I want to I wanna emulate 
something like that with those like crispy I don't know it's just like all those seconds just crunched right together worked so well in that in the, piece in the opening or in the second movement I can't remember which movement it was it maybe maybe it was the second one the part um, where it's or the part where oh the opening of the first movement yeah because yeah it's kind of a contrapuntal part that ends up making chords you're right between the two yeah, guitars yeah. yeah yeah there's like all these major sevenths in there and stuff it was really wild so cool yeah super uh, wild such beautiful dissonance yes it's Rodrigo the way I explain Rodrigo to my students is like you play a major chord and then just add an extra minor second somewhere you know <laughs> yeah it's just, just like anywhere you want E major with a D sharp it's nice you know um, <laughs> like yeah uh, okay, uh, track number three. Yeah, it's Dusan Bogdanovich. You got that. Which piece is it, this? It, uh, six fucking miniatures? No, no, no. It's a piece for two guitars. That may or may not reference amphibians. Oh, cool. So cool. Um, I don't know. I thought maybe you and Kyle would have tried this piece, actually. No, okay. It's a, it's called No it's, Feathers. It's not the sonata. Sorry, it's not the Sonata Fantasia. I know that, right? No, no, not the Sonata Fantasia. It's um, it's No Feathers on this Frog. Yeah, I don't know that one, but that sounds. Oh I'll have to gosh. check that one. Can okay, you say it one more time? No Feathers on the what? No Feathers on this Frog. No feathers on this frog. There's a great video of Dushan playing it with, um, what is his name? Giles Ryan or something? Some American guitarist who I didn't know until I saw this video. But him and Dushan, I think, both taught at San Francisco Conservatory back in like the 90s, 80s, uh, 90s, 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, and they played this recital where they did this piece. And every time he performs this piece live with another guitarist, they improvise on it. Oh my so gosh. So it starts with like this five minute improv of like him and. Um, Giles or whatever this guy's name is like. Does he have any recordings of it online? Um, yeah, there's multiple recordings of of Dushan playing it with different people. Like there's like two or three, and then there's a bunch of studio recordings. Yeah, some of Dushan uh, Dushan's um, ornamentations with the with the flat twos and the flat fours are are just super delicious to me. I don't know. I I, I took a lot from from his uh, polyrhythmic etudes and his um, six Balkan miniatures too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's some in the second piece you played at the beginning. There was some. Bogdanovich esque little moments. Um, yeah. Anyways, it's a really cool dual piece. You should check it out. Uh, uh, yeah. Who are the players? Um, oh, is it a, right. You have to guess the players. I have to guess the players. Yeah, I, I tried to find okay. a recording of this that had players you would know, but I didn't even know these players. So I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you know. Oh. Uh, can I hear them again? <laughs> I mean, I know you know Kupinski, so that's not it. And I know you know um, the other couple duo that I can't remember Duel the name Elise, of right now. Uh, yeah, Duomelis. Elise. Elise. And um, I don't know. I don't know this one. Yeah, I, they're, they're really great. But um, the gruber Makler duo. gruber Maklo. Is, Ma is that what you said? Maklar. gruber Maklar. Maklar, okay. Yeah. I'll give you. So cool. I'll give you one and a half out of three because it's kind of cheeky to include players that I know you probably. Okay. Uh, okay. So in beginner category, you got three out of three, two out of three, and one and a half out of three. So in total, six and a half out of nine. Not bad. Okay. It's like a B minus. It's a respectable, C plus, respectable grade. About how I did in grade school. Yep. Okay. Next one. <laughs> so you can ask the audience for help in one piece. Mm, okay. Do um, you want to hear the beginning of this, though? Do I have one lifeline? Yeah, one lifeline. <laughs> Alec Pearson plays this piece. If he's watching. I'm not familiar with it. I, I remember the the repeated chords, the bump, 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 and I'm trying to place the Dun. the 
crunchy harmonies as a Can you guess the composer at least? Yeah, I'm trying to get the composer. You this composer. Would it be Tedesco? Close, but no, not Tedesco. I also know the second guy I'm thinking in my head is not it, so I've got three guesses, right? I'll give you one more for the composer. Um, it's not another Rodrigo, is it? Nope, it's Ponce. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. It's Ponce. Um, theme variations and finale. That's a big piece. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not the. Well, it is a big piece, but it's not the fugue and variations. Not the full. Yeah. That's okay. I'm getting those confused. Yeah. yeah. Um. And who's the player? Can you guess? Any idea? I'm just gonna take a stab in the in the dark here. It sounds. It sounds like Kiwi Park. No, it's Jude Kapoor. No. Oh, Zutikail. Okay. Yeah, he has a pretty, re not super recent, but two or three years ago, um, Nexo CD of Al Ponce. Oh, that's awesome. I and actually, for this out. piece, he has a recording on that CD of the original 1928 manuscript and then the Segovia version. So he recorded both versions because they're so different. Oh, I remember that. We had a master class with him when he came to Vancouver, and uh, that was one of the things we talked about with the Sonata Romantica, the Hofstock versions. Yeah. I'll, so, I'll definitely have to check that out. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit disappointed that I haven't already. Yeah, you should listen to the CD. It's great. He only does the comparison yeah. recording with just that piece, but a lot of the other recordings he uses stuff from like the Hopstock editions and everything. I mean, because he knows what's up, you know. Yeah, he does for sure. Um, Jacopo Garimano says, "Greetings from Italy." Hi, Jacopo. Very nice to see Hi, you joining us. Yeah, he's he's on Instagram with us. Ah, uh, nice, cool. Yeah. Um. Okay, so well, I'm sorry, Jacob. You got zero out of three for that one. I figured I was, I'm at least going to get a few more of those, I'm sure. Especially if this is the intermediate category, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm only slightly disappointed in you. <sighs> Just kidding. Ouch, your disappointment stings, Mike. <laughs> Just joking. Um, oh, I, okay, the next one I didn't actually put on the list. Okay, I found it anyways in my edit. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> the player yes is it bream it's bream wow that's yeah. good here's jacob it's bream and here's the beginning of the piece it's not a guitar piece actually it's a transcription It's Ravel. Oh, wait. So it's Ravel. Um, oh, don't. I can't forget this one. I feel like I played this melody in a duo in my undergrad, and I. Probably. Oh, man. You're going to be really disappointed for me, but I, I, I can't remember the name of this piece. You there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I'm just, I'm just waiting. Oh yeah, I said I said the thing, and you're just kind of like zoning out, kind of like slowly turning. I was like, did he did he hear the thing? Is it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. what, what was the thing again? I, 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 I you're gonna be disappointed, but I can't. I just can't remember the name of it right now. Oh okay, it's uh, Pavana por una infanta de Funt, Pavan for a dead princess. Ah, oh, see, I wouldn't have remembered that. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I know it's it's one of those situations where I'm sure I've heard it a thousand times, but I can't I can't place the name. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got Bream out my, like right away, so that's good. Not bad. Okay, next one in the intermediate category. You ready? I'm ready. Super ready. Okay, here we go.
transcription? Is it Bach? Yeah, it's Bach. If you can name like the type of piece and like the instrument it's originally for, then that's fine. I hear a lot of campanella and cross string and ringing over, so my gut is telling me that it was written for something like the harpsichord or the organ. Yeah, it was uh, written for keyboard, so you're right. So it was keyboard, so it's... And it, what, what sort of, it's a multi-movement work, but what sort of piece is it from, or what's the movement that this is, if you're the name of either of those? Um, from a keyboard? Not a partitia, right? Partita! Oh, yeah! Keyboard partita oh, number... Cool. Uh, wait, it's the E minor keyboard partita. I never remember the number. Number six. I've never heard that piece. It sounds beautiful. It's really cool. Um, it's... This is... Oh, oh, who's the player? Sorry, we almost skipped that. Oh, part. let me hear one more time. Hmm? It's powerful. Um, yes, very powerful. Creamy tone. Yeah. Who plays Bach like this? Uh, would it be um, Would it be Drew? No, it's David Russell. Oh, okay. What a compliment to Drew Henderson, though. Drew, if you're listening, Jacob yeah. just compared you to David Russell. So yeah, well, I just know he plays on that beautiful eight string. I know he just plays Bach on uh, that beautiful eight yeah, string. Actually, so, my o. So speaking of this, this is on six string. There's a version by Hubert Capel for six string, which is this version. But wow. Um, Daniel Ramjatan, I don't know if you know Daniel, but he he's like from our kind of generation in Toronto. He just got a seven string and he's playing a version for it for seven string now. Ooh, that sounds really nice. Cool, because some of those big yeah. like arpeggiated chords you can just like. Oh, sounds so good. Yes. David Russell, man. David Russell. I gotta okay, I gotta got keep those big players in my mind. Two out of three because you've got Bach and the piece. So four out of nine in the, in the intermediate category. Not bad. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, remember, in your listening tests in school, you had, like, uh, the list ahead of time of what's going to be played. In this case, you have, like, the whole guitar literature to choose from, so. Yeah, for sure. This is the this is the pro league. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, advanced category. Tram. You knew it so fast. Yeah, Graham. I recognize that. Okay. I love this CD. What's the name of this piece, though? Okay, but um, you can name the players, right? Uh, yeah, so I know Tosin Abasi is the guitarist. There's two uh, guitarists. And I know... Excuse me, there's two... One of the guitarists. Uh, I know the drummer is from Mars Volta, but I can't. I can't name him. I don't know his no, name. No, isn't the drummer from Suicidal Tendencies? What? Or maybe he's also in Mars. Oh no, no, no! I think that's the wind, woodwind player. Maybe. Ooh, one of the guys is from Mars Volta, and I always thought it was the drummer because of his just super erratic dr like style. Um, right, yeah. But I always, I also feel like I heard the sax player, or the the, or the reed player in uh, Volta too. He might be in multiple bands. So, but who's the other guitarist? It is. You don't know the second guitarist of Animals as Leaders? Oh my gosh. Oh, is, is it Reyes? Yeah, it's Javier. Javier Reyes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. they just like. I didn't know they them. played together. I thought it was just uh, Tosin in there. No, no, no. It's both of them. They paired up for that one, and then there's a reed player whose name I don't remember the reed and the drum, the drummer name, but I know okay, one I'll of them is from Mars. That's 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 good enough. And the the song is. Uh, it's like. It's actually doesn't it actually have kind of a descriptive title like a. Uh, it actually has kind of a classical descriptive title no not and this I... one uh, it's endeavor 
Endeavor, okay. Nice, two out of three. Oh, man, nice. Throwing some tram in there. I, I like that. Yeah, well, they're a good example of why we can't be too pretentious with Class 3 cards. Right. Um, okay, uh, next next track. Sounds early twentieth century. Yeah, it's in the twentieth century. I don't know if early exactly, but yeah, not too late. Trying to like suck as many hints out of this as I can get. I don't actually know. Um, um, um what's a hint I can give you that won't give it away? Uh, this is one of the most prolific guitar composers who is still living of the twentieth century. Sergio Sad. Nope. Oh, I jumped the gun too quickly. You get one more guess. I'll be kind. That sounds like Sergio to me. I don't know. Can I hear a little bit of it again? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be so upset if I can't get this. One of the most prolific guitar composers who is still living. It's not Brower. It's Brower. It's Brower? That's Brower? I know. That's why it's in the advanced category, because it doesn't sound like Brower. It doesn't sound like... What? Well, like... okay, you gave me a hint. I'm going to accept a half a point on that. No, no, no. no. You, this is fine. You got, you got this. Brower. It's fine. Brower. Wow. Uh, I don't know that piece. Okay, it's it's from his second suite. It's the prelude from the second suite. Prelude this is like one of his like very early pieces when he was writing like quite folky music, like Day in November kind of, you know? Right, right. Yeah. That's beautiful. I, I've never really heard nice. that piece before. It's super nice suite. The... Yeah. How many movements is it? Three. Three. I want to say, yeah. It's it's also not like it's not a big suite. Like all the movements are short. They're really nice. Oh, I like that. Suite number two. I think it's what I love about Brower's music is that like he's got some really advanced stuff, but the accessible stuff is so so beautiful, so nice. The yeah. shorter, the shorter, more like bite-sized things. It's true, and there are a lot of like more advanced pieces that are not too long if you don't play the sonatas. I mean, there's yeah. just a lot. There's a lot to choose from. Yeah, definitely. Um. Uh, the player, player, right? Can I hear it again? Just a little bit? This is a Scottish player. Oh. I don't think I know any Scottish players off the top of my head. It's Matthew that, McAllister. That... Oh. Okay, Matthew McAllister. Okay, okay but you got um, one out of three for guessing Brower eventually. Um, also, Kevin Lowe says, loving the song. What's the name of that again? I think he means the Tram song. So it's by Tram, T period, R period, A period, M, uh, which is, what's the album called from this again? It's called um, Seven Somethings from Somethings. Lingua Franca is the album. Lingua, Lingua Franca, Franca, yeah. By Tram. It's the guitarist from Animals as Leaders, Tosin Abasi, mm -hmm. his project. Mm -hmm. If you search, search Tram Tosin, it will come up. Yeah. Okay. It's a crazy album. Some of it's really hard to digest, but it's really fun. It's really cool. I really love it. It's such a cool ensemble, too. Two eight string electrics with woodwind and drums. Like, it's a really cool ensemble. And I think the thing that blows my mind about that album is that they have so many abstracted melodies that they're unison on. Yes. Or that they do, like, a weird interval between them and then they play the same melody. It's very. Um, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's really out there um, yeah. over, like, a completely different harmony. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, last track. You ready for the last track in the game? I'm ready. See how we do here. Ready.
I may as well use it now. Who's out there? That's true. Okay, anyone? There's there's not too many people watching, but anyone watching who can help Jacob with this, please help him identify this piece. <laughs> So let's see if anyone can help, because it takes them a moment to see. To hear. Anyone able to? <laughs> I don't see a whole lot of uh, activity right now. I might be on my own. It's okay. I think you're on uh, your own. I'll give you a hint. This is a French composer. French composer. I'm going to I'm going to also guess early 20th century because it still feels like it's got a waltzy feel and kind of a romantic feel, but it's I got some pretty I would classify him as early 20th century. Oh, another. Okay. Okay. I I actually have no idea on either the piece it's or a, the composer here. It's a guitar here. composer. Dians? Yeah, Dians. I I should oh my god, French composer. I should have I should have gone with the maestro. Yeah, yeah, maestro Dians. Um Oh man, too many right, here. It's a waltz. It's, I'll give you half a point for the waltz cuz it's Valse in Sky. Oh. So you know how he has Tango in Sky? He also has right. Valse in Sky. I guess I've never heard that. That's awesome. I got to check that piece out. I've always really yeah, loved it. Yeah, it's on Okay, and who's the player? This player teaches in San Francisco. Currently? I'm not answering that question. Ta Tom Avilato. No, he doesn't teach in San Francisco. Toma Villa teaches, teaches in Peabody. Oh, that, no, that's right, that's right. Uh, okay, hang on a second. Somebody replaced Sergio Assad recently, and I need to know this, because I've known it. And no, I it's not have... him. It's not that person. Someone who's oh, for really? Long. Yes. So it's not Judicale, then? No, Judicale replaced Sergio, but it's not him. I don't know, man. It's Mark Teicholtz. The, uh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot. Yeah. He also, he, um, how long has Mark been there? He's been there Mark for a long time. Been there, yeah, a long time. Yeah, I was supposed to go study with Mark, but I didn't because uh, tuition costs are wow. too high in the states. So. Yeah, Southern California schools, man, they're intense. Yeah. It's really intense. I yeah. was gonna go to Peabody too and study with um, Julian Gray, and uh, I can't. I'm a classical guitarist, man. I can't afford to go six figures in debt yeah no you know? i don't know it's unless you get like i got a decent scholarship but it was like still just not worth it same here yeah like it's crazy yeah it's brutal i mean that's the good thing about europe and canada to an extent canada's not that expensive i mean it is more expensive than here in europe i think but not by a lot i mean compared to what i grew up with and what i was prepared for canada was like a blessing man it was amazing to, to come up here and study yeah i can imagine for the price that we studied for Anyhow, enough about that. Okay, so you got um, you got one and a half out of three because you got you guessed waltz. So all right, I can handle so it. So in the final category, you've got four point five out of nine. Not mm. bad. More than the intermediate category. Yeah. So in total, you're at uh fifteen out of twenty seven. More than fifty percent. Okay, I can. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take yeah, it. Not bad at all, man. Good job. Okay. Thanks. Let's hear you play some music. We've been yammering right on. a long time. So what right are you going to play for us? I'm going to tune, and then I'm going to play um, another two-movement piece uh, called Meditation Number 3. So this piece was very heavily inspired by Dusan Bogdanovich and his sort of jumpy dance rhythms, His sort of the, the, the Balkan miniatures where he has a lot of very... Um, Interesting divisions of twos and threes, you know. I just, I just love the way they bounce back and forth and give us a different groove for the feel, a feel for the groove. And at the time, I was also listening to a lot of Tigran, Neon Tigran Hamasian, and I was just obsessed with writing music that kind of fell along those same melodic, sort of the modal melodic sounds that we're getting. So this is a two movement piece called Intimation and Danza. But I got a tune first. Awesome. Naturally. Cool. Well, I'll take care of my video. What's the tuning? 
to D6 tuning. So imagine t you're tuning down to lute tuning, where you drop the third string down to an F sharp. Yeah. And then you take the six in the first string and drop them down to a D. Ah, cool. Yeah. So you get kind of a D major six sound. are all right give me two seconds here i should have been doing this the entire time i was oh guitarists you. always having to do their nails okay folks well Dang, nails, i will just... entertain you while jacob does his nails it's Actually, well it's not going to be high maintenance nail taking care of uh, of age but man it's one of those things that as soon as i feel the scrapage on my strings it just drives me crazy so i'm just going to take yeah, some no no it's not, sandpiper. it's not worth um playing with, with with scratchy nails for sure yeah i um i've been using fakes which has been interesting Nice though for practicing. I mean, when I had to do, when I learn a program like I am for this exam, that's huge and difficult. It's nice to have nails where you can practice as much as you want if you really have to, you know? You so. just replace them if they go bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you have control over the length all the time. Anyways, enough about <laughs> nails. Let's hear you play some music. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's mostly good.
gorgeous, man. Nice job. Thank you. Thank Beautiful. you, thank you. I wish I had your right hand. The right hand? Why? Uh, just like your control over like, you know, percussion and stuff. It's amazing. Oh, thanks, man. You know, it's, it's, cool. it's, it's fun. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun to, to play like that, you know? Nice. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, in the, you don't realize as a classical guitarist how much we get used to like one wrist position, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Not like this, obviously. That would be bad. But <laughs> yeah. But like um, like this. Yeah. Wrap your arms. One right hand position. The Tibo Garcia position. Um. <laughs> yeah. The uh, this uh, Segovia. Yeah. I mean, he sounds. Uh, Tibo is amazing, but I, I don't understand how he do, how he plays like that. I just don't get it. Just seems so painful. Yeah. But, I mean, he's he's got it. He's got it under control for it sure. It works for him. Anyways, my point is like you know we get used to having one position, and I remember last year playing the fifth Brower Sonata, and there's like this these sections in the third movement where you have to like mute a lot of notes and also do a lot of Bartok pizzicatos and also normal yeah. pizzicatos in between other notes and I realized how much I'm not used to like this stuff you know well one of my students has a big problem with that I mean he's a good he's a good finger style guitar player he's learning a lot of really great music and uh, one thing he's having trouble with is actually plucking like pizzicato and bass but leaving actually I think he's like plucking pizzicato with all of his fingers at the same time right yeah. and that takes a certain amount of like adjustment like micro adjustments and yeah it's, yeah. it's tricky to, to constantly shift back and forth yeah i had a student less or i have a student who played in the previous recital i ran for my students he played oh what is the piece oh he, he played sorry he played let it be from the beatles but like one of these finger style arrangements oh, yeah. with, with like a ton of percussion and stuff there's like this finger style guitarist on youtube who does a lot of like really quite intricate arrangements of these kind of pop songs with like all the rhythm parts built into like the wrist and stuff and it was a real exercise teaching that because like I don't do a lot of those techniques all the time, you know. So how like, did you find it? I mean, it was okay. I mean, he had the score he bought from the pl the the guy who transcribed it, and the score was great. Like it was highly detailed, very clear. Like all the percussive parts were written in with like special like symbols and stuff. But like I had to really watch his right hand and be like, okay, what's the most effective way to do this motion? Because you just apply the same principles that you do to like classical playing, you know. You look for like an effective motion that doesn't create unnecessary tension and that is quick and gets the sound you want basically right yeah yeah but it takes a lot of practice yeah yeah but it's hard to do that with something that you're not like familiar with you know yeah i mean there are a couple of techniques in this album and in this piece that i learned from other finger style guitarists where they're just kind of like just that backbeat that they're yeah. doing it just is a standard pop backbeat you're like that's easy but it's really like it's it's a bit tricky uh, to to just play and beat at the same time. Yeah, it's, when it's a, you um when you f fuck with your right hand wrist position, it just really like can derail you like you know nothing. Yeah, else, well, I mean, you're so used to getting we're we're both kind of used to getting not really locked in this kind of position with the straight wrist and the over the top um, position, but like anytime you do this, you have to completely reset it, right? Like yeah, and I, I think that's yeah that's the trickiest part about about it for sure. Yeah. Anyways, it's just impressive to see. Um, yeah, and it's like I think you know that the playing the brass note was eye opening for me because all the extra pizzicato notes, uh, sometimes even with higher notes that weren't pizzicato at the same time, really made me like rethink how I practiced my right hand a little bit in those sections. And yeah, definitely. It's also a cool texture. Like you don't hear that texture very often in classical guitar music. It would be kind of cool to hear more. You know. The, are you talking about the bar talk or the percussion? Like doing pizzicato while there are other notes going on that aren't pizzicato, for example, yeah. or things like that. You know, yeah. like just stuff where, yeah, you're using the palm for other things, basically. Well, I think that's kind of the beauty of the guitar, right? I mean, there are so many like hidden textures that make it sound like more than one instrument. Yeah, true, for yeah. sure. Um, I usually ask most of the guests to share like a technical or musical tip. So do you have anything like that? Something you've done with your students or, or even a way of practicing or something about composition? What's like a sort of... Method yeah, I've share. been thinking a little. I've been thinking a little bit about this, and it's kind of along the same lines of what we were just talking about. It has a lot to do with right hand independence and making sure that you're sort of. I always use the term calibrated with my students, making sure that you're calibrated with your right hand and your strings, um, because a lot of students. Um, we all have troubles with the left hand, but I find that a lot of inaccuracies happen in the right hand, especially when we're playing um, classical and finger style guitar. So um, one, uh, my last Q&A a couple of weeks ago, I think a couple of my students who are on here now will probably recognize this one, but I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with, with cross-string trills and cross-string scales now because of the, the, the benefit that it's had for my right hand. I'm not even gonna play with my left hand, but 
uh, say we're doing like groups of four, groups of three, I mean, we can just start up on the top two strings and go, um, for, for those who aren't guitarists listening, thumb, middle, index, ring. Just play a one cross string trill, four tr cross string trills on, on that set of strings, and then just keep going down. And you can either hold a chord underneath it or play, um, you, can, you can do cross string scales with this, but it's a little bit advanced. But I, I just, for, for me, I find that doing um, cross string trills with open strings, whether they're in groups of three or in groups of four, is really, it's a really low impact um, calibration warm up for me whenever I'm playing at the beginning of the day. You know? By low impact, what do you mean? Like low, like low cost, basically? Low, low, yeah, low impact. By, by that, I mean it doesn't feel like it. Uh, takes a lot of strain out of my hand to do it. Oh, uh, it doesn't impact your hand a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a simple... It takes a lot of control, yeah. obviously, but it... I mean, I, I, I've started teaching a couple of students that, and it's, it's a hard... It's a long it's a long burn, right? It takes a long time to get used to the motion, but it's not terribly, like, strenuous, as if we're stretching in our right, right hand right. or... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I, I mean, mean... It's always good to do technique that's, like, basic motions that you can build, you know? Yeah, and I think the fun part about something like that is if you've got a, an, an interesting tuning or an interesting chord or an interesting chord progression, you can make a little riff or, out of it or a little lick out of it. Cool. I mean, that's, that's like a that's like a detailed kind of warm up. Um, as you far should, as just speaking of those a, a I I do a I M P cross string like trills on two strings. A I A I M. Wait, say that again. A I M P. A I M P. I guess I'm not so catching like, that. I mean, I'm I mean, starting on the lower this string? This is like a t trill where you want to do like one string and then the other constantly. So it's like first string A, second string I, first string M, second string P. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, I do that a lot. But there's this section in that Hofstock piece I was telling you about, that Alan Wilcox WC Variations piece I play, where you have to do that on the upper two strings. And then and you start by playing the fourth string with the thumb. And you do um, trills in the left hand on the lower string while you do the cross string trills on the higher two strings. So you get two simultaneous on two different places. Um, That's awesome. Um, yeah. Oh, Daniel Ramstein is saying I always did AMIP, but it's bizarre. Yeah, I tried the AMIP thing too, but the I finger reaching over was AMIP. Actually, no, I do that. I do that. Sorry, it's just oh. I do it automatically now. I do that because it's tremolo fingering. So I reach over further with the I finger, like Daniel's saying. The first time, yeah, the first time I thought about reaching over with my index finger was when we were learning um, the sweeps in the second movement of the um, Aranjuez, yeah. Aranjuez, and Daniel, I was just like doing this with my ring finger, just kind of like everybody else was uh, on YouTube. Um, but for some reason, it really worked for me when Daniel said uh, P, P, I, M, A, I, and then sweep back. Yeah, yeah, it works better sometimes. For, for some reason, that was really, that felt really natural to, to do something like that. So yeah. sometimes the cross string stuff, uh, or the, cr the, um, crossing your fingers over it is actually strangely idiomatic. It, it feels like it just fits really yeah, well. Yeah, it works. Oh, and Daniel's saying I do that exactly because it's tremolo. Yeah, I this the same thing. Yeah. I actually did switch to the AMIP thing. You have to turn the right hand a little bit to get it um, right where the eye goes over, but it it works much better because it's tremolo fingering. But it's a real mind fuck when you have to also slur with the left hand at the same time as you do those. Yeah. And keep do you know? Do you know Tigran's piece, Love Song? No. Uh, it's on his album with Red Hail. It came out in 2008, I think. Um, but there's a, a section in there where I think it's something like that. Oh, I, I'm not in tune for it. I don't know. Why am I not remembering how to do this? Anyway, boom, da dum dum, boom, ba da 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 dum. Those little da 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 are trills and fifths. Yeah, and I'll I'll just do the, oh, and then, oh, that's it. Oh wow, okay, yeah. It it I'm in a weird. Oh yeah, it's because I'm in I'm in an awkward tuning. The same kind of idea, but I'm just doing I am there, so it's it's not not anything crazy complicated. Right. But I imagine the, the you problem can get is those. in this Hopstock piece, it's like an extended like, you know. How many hours did you spend on that one? Uh, quite a few. Still, still spending some hours, but it's on YouTube if you want to watch it in my Brussels competition video. I do, I do want to watch that. That um, sounds really cool. Yeah, Daniel's saying, and negative string crossings are more manageable when I, f I find when you're going AI going up. 
Um, yes, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Like crossing over is better going up than coming down. I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. that makes a lot of sense for sure. Yeah, um, and Daniel, you, I don't know if you missed it, but we shouted you out with your seven string Bach earlier. So um, I want to hear that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So cross string trills, those are important and useful. That's a good. Yeah. I mean, that's just a good physical exercise for me. I really like doing that because I always talk about calibration, and it's funny because I, I think a lot of my students don't really know what touch screen calibration is because right. they have heat sensitive screens and I'm used to I grew up with pressure sensitive screens so you had to like calibrate so they're like what does calibrate mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it's just like one of those I'm like oh god I'm so the generational old. gap is, is you're playing spreading the no. of time, Jacob you're playing the Ocarina of Time right now that's how old you are I opened that game up I was like oh man da, 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 da. I melted and then the then the uh, copyright screen popped up. I was like copyright 1998 or something I'm like yeah, 98. That wasn't that long ago. Uh, it was 22 years ago. 22 years ago, Jacob. God damn. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, have you heard the Ottawa Guitar Trio, Nathan Bredesen's trio with Alex Bougie yeah. and uh, Francois Lassell? They play a lot of like video game music, actually, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard some of their music. I think I heard them do... Did they, they're the one that did the Star Wars arrangements, too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're awesome. Really yeah, it's did they do cool. a bunch of Legend of Zelda stuff? Yeah, they recently put out a video of the Song of Healing because COVID-19. Oh, yeah. Nice. Hashtag relevant. Um, yeah, for sure. You got I, love that. That. I love that tune. All the tunes from, the Legends, from Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are so good. Well, I've been playing so much Ocarina of Time, and I was like, uh, like a month ago when I started it, I was like, oh, man, just the music in here is so nostalgic, and Koji Kondo is just such a clever composer. He's able to, like, catch capture so many, like, I mean, it's, it's cheesy, but it's, like, really it's like really catchy, and I love it, and it's nostalgic. It's like, which one of these songs do I want to arrange for the guitar? I want to play something. I want to play one of these songs on guitar. Mm -hmm. So I spent a couple of weeks uh, arranging the Hyrule Field theme oh, uh, cool. for the guitar, uh, and it's about 10 pages long, and it's pretty dense, but it's it's going to be really cool. I nice. think it's, it's hard to play, but it's... Because there's so many... It's orchestral. There's so many layers to it, and I want to try to include what's... Uh, practical but what still sounds good and awesome um but yeah it's a good you challenge check out, there's this 8-bit music theory channel on youtube and they do a comparison of all the overworld themes from legends of zelda like all the hyrule oh really it's really cool yeah yeah, yeah i'll they, check that like, out it's like a guy who's like trained in classical music so he breaks down all these video game music on like a theoretical terms and then also like emotional impact of the theoretical choices of the composers it's cool i'm glad that he does that that's something that we forget about when we're talking theory is the emotional impact yeah, a little bit. Daniel Ramson left a link, but I don't know what it is, and I can't click it, otherwise it will interfere with the sound. So if someone can tell me what that link is, that would be cool. Let me see if I can uh, check that out. Is it on Facebook or YouTube? Daniel. Um, okay, cool. Well, thanks for the tip on cross-string scales, Jacob. This is great. You're welcome. Um, I think we can play some music again soon, but do you have general ideas about practicing? Like, how do you approach practicing? What's your approach been lately? How do you feel like the practicing is going? bad <laughs> i haven't practiced all, almost at all the the first two tunes i played for you i worked back up yesterday and i was like real stressed about it and i was like oh no i haven't played these songs in so long well you're doing uh, great considering that you're just like practicing again that shows oh, that i appreciate that I, I that's the part of it i guess but one of my i'm lucky because that last tune that i played uh, one of my students is learning as well so I, i've been practicing that one that's the part of why i included it I'll play another tune for you that I'm practicing up for um, a music video that I'm going to record this week. But I try, it's weird when you're not regimented as you are, I mean, in school you're not really regimented, but you have a timeline, right? You have yeah. three months or six months to learn a set amount of rep that you've chosen, and you can build your schedule however you want, right? But when I got out of school, I was practicing a lot for my album, and then I released the album, and I toured, and I didn't need to practice that much, and then I took a break for a while, did a bunch of transcription, and the last few months, like I told you earlier, has been all about transcription. But I think if I were to summarize the way that I practice now, it, it has to be um, with, with a goal in mind, obviously. I, it's, it's hard for me to just do raw technical practice you know what actually I wouldn't say that recently I've been in standard tuning and practicing a lot of arpeggios and one thing I've been really really loving is doing three string scales with MIP 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 and then PIM PI, or PMI 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 oh three finger scales you mean three yeah three finger scales not yeah three string scales um 
Uh, so I'll go up an arpeggio, up to the fifth, and then down, and then down, and I'll do the, the scale in the same way. And um, that kind of technical practice is, is really great for me to warm up on. It's a little bit, uh, that one is a little bit more high impact on the hands. It feels a little bit more intense to kind of just start with that. Um, yeah. But if, if you wanted to start slow, I would say maybe uh, what, I, what I would do is, is just practice um, slurs. I mean, my, my grounding force of, of practice when I was in undergrad and graduate school was just starting out with all the different combinations of fingers, um, compound slurs, upward slurs, downward slurs, hammer-ons, pull, all that stuff. I would just kind of start with that. And if I were ambitious, I would do three fingers and like stretch and do that. I mean, that, felt, that always felt like a great way for me to start my practice. I would probably spend 15 minutes doing that. Yeah. even 20 or 30 just because it felt after you get warmed up it feels really nice right for sure oh mm. daniel saying is the ocarina of time suite played by the ottawa guitar trio okay the relevant links thank you daniel we always appreciate the relevant links if we're ever talking about stuff and anyone watching wants to find the links for it please like put them in the comments because people who go watch the video later will find it helpful you know yeah definitely so if we're I'll referencing a That's piece or a recording people find it and linking it it's helpful yeah okay let's hear you play some more music man what are you gonna yeah. play I'm gonna. Oh, I, I haven't actually planned anything past this part. So, um, what am I gonna play? Do you want to hear something low and slow, or something punchy and percussive? Let's hear something low and slow. The last piece was pretty punchy. That was pretty punchy. So I'm actually gonna. Always with the tuning here. Yeah. Jacob Sayer tunes live stream. saying low and slow oh i missed it earlier it was there was a hilarious little exchange um kevin lowe says awesome playing loving the sound what guitar are you using and then rye bear says it's a gr bear concert model wahoo <laughs> uh yes yeah so there's no, no there's right. no shame in self-promotion especially yeah, in this exactly. context it's a beautiful guitar it's, i love the headstock i mean well, i love the whole the sound is great too the sound is amazing but the headstock looks cool <laughs> Well, the, the, the sound is what drew me in this tuning specifically. Uh, well, it's a little bit different of a tuning. In my, in my meditation number two, I, I have a tuning that's in this same register with a low C. And I had been playing a bunch of guitars trying to find the right one to record my album on. And I played Dave Traff again, and I had played Nicole Alan, Al, uh, Alan Isaac. I can't remember the way she pronounces her name. Uh, but I, I had played like a handful of Luthier guitars, and then I played Rise. And all the other guitars were great, but this guitar had been... Actually, Itamar Erez played this guitar on tour. Um, oh, cool. And uh, there are a couple of thumb of like percussive thumb marks from him up here, and I just feel like I just gotta keep it, you know, just like a little a little piece of Itamar is giving me power to play. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah. I I tuned it way down, and I just played that first like that first low note, and I just oh my god, there's a video of it on Instagram somewhere of that moment, and it's just like that was I I gotta buy this guitar, it's so beautiful. But yeah. the classical the the slotted headstock was really nice because I still you know. I have such a history with uh, classical guitar and classical guitar music. I just yeah. If you like squint and don't notice the cutaway, it looks like it could be classical. Yeah, yeah and I, I've actually played for a handful of people that thought it sounded like a classical guitar, which is a really yeah. Interesting it has thing. some of the. It's, I mean, it's cedar, no? cedar. Yeah. yeah, western red cedar, cedar Australian blackwood, back and sides. Yeah, it has that kind of deep cedar sound for sure. Which is crazy because I always used to be into the punchy spruce sound, right? Yeah, but now you're using steel strings, right? Like I think cedar guitars do better when you br pair them with really bright strings. I mean, I don't like necessarily using carbons on my spruce, but on my cedar guitar, I love the carbon strings because they're a lot brighter, you know. And the yeah, kind of brings darker, that balance so you, get this, you get a nice balance, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm in love with this guitar. I've had it for uh, two years now, um, and I. Uh, don't see any I mean guitarists are notorious for buying guitars right but I, I think this might be my last one for a while I'd really love to work with Rye if you're still there I'd really like to work with you on a custom at some point but you know yeah. money and stuff yeah yeah for sure um, but I I know what you mean though like I'm really really happy with mine made by Ross Chiasson but it's kind of the kind of thing where I would like to get another guitar eventually but only because I want to try different kinds of guitars you know 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you gotta try out the, you gotta taste the different woods, you gotta feel the different uh, fretboard feels. Yeah, and, and I wanted like a double top eventually because this one's like a lattice and you know that kind of stuff. But like, I think for like a lattice cedar, this is like the only guitar I could want, you know. Um, Rises, yeah. Rises, I also agree. Yes. Nice. Okay, so what's the name of the piece you're playing? This. My strings are fresh as of yesterday, so this is a pretty extreme tuning. This piece is uh, one that I composed in 2012 called Time Lapse. It's on, it's on my first album, A Change in Season. It's recorded by my buddy in Cape Girardeau, Shadrick Beecham. Shout out to you. Nice. Um, and this, for those of you who are watching, is going to be my next music video. This week I'll be um, doing, I'm going to try to be doing as high of a production value as I can do in my own apartment with my own equipment, you know? Yeah, I think we're all so. in that boat. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see what we can do with it. I, I, I've gotten some tips from my student, Jeremy, who's um, a great fingerstyle guitarist and, a, and an, an improving videographer. So he, he gave me some good tips. So I'll, I'll, nice. I'll mess around with some camera angles and some lighting and mic placement and all that junk. So we'll see yeah, how it goes. I, I, I just bought some new lights. And, yeah, anyways, studio stuff. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay, so time lapse. Nice. Time lapse, here it goes.
Thank you, thank you. Slower and dreamier. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. I think my old mentor told me that sounded like it was supposed to have been in a soap opera once, and I was like, ah, I don't know if I like that compliment, but I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, is that really a compliment? I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know if I agree, but nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rye Bear says, that's still one of my favorite sounding guitars I've made to date in your hands, of course. Aww. Very yeah, sweet. this has been this has been a, a real treat to play like for years. I just I keep finding new things about it that I love. Nice. And Ruel Morales says nice change in the B section, Jacob. Oh, nice. Thanks, Ruel. There's some cool um, cool harmonic shifts there. Oh, I, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah, I, I I'm always after. Um, I guess you could call it the flat too. Which right. is really, I, I wouldn't say it's really common in Spanish. It's a little bit, it's pretty common in Spanish music, uh, Middle Middle Eastern music as well, but I don't know, also dramatic film music. I, I don't know, I, I feel like that's a very film music-y tune to me. Yeah. And um, yeah. you know, if, if my home key is, I really like the way yeah. that, that sounds. I really like the way that that feels. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Takes you to another world for a moment. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I also wanted to ask you about like your current projects. So you, so you have two CDs out, right? Mm -hmm. A Change of Season and Migration. And people That's can it. find them online on your Spotify and other things. But um, yeah. also you mentioned to me that you started a Patreon and you're doing some like video content production through that. So what's, what are you producing through that? So, so far I've produced two instructional videos. They're both about a half an hour long. One goes over four essential percussive guitar techniques. The other is kind of a um, throw you into the deep end on cross string scales. Um, I'm planning on producing another uh, episode of cross string scale practice that'll actually just be more about the fundamentals like cross string scales in different keys, C major, G major, E minor, A minor, um, just some of, the, some of the basic keys, but how you can use cross string scales to benefit your playing and how it's good exercise. It's, it's that kind of instructional material where it's not quite basic or fundamental uh, guitar playing skills. It's kind of catered more towards a, a committed learner. Um, just because right now that's what I'm really excited about um, talking about. And once well, I get. Um, and also for Patreon, that's the people who will support you, the people who really want the more, you know, advanced the in depth instruction. stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm really focusing on right now is I've, I've got a about a four page plan of uh, It's just an outline of it's a four page outline of, of videos that I'm ready to produce and it, it's gonna take me years and years to finish it off But I'm, I'm really really looking forward to it. Uh, my page. I have six patrons right now, and they all know what's going on uh, um, for different levels of your patronage you get um, exclusive content which is basically like updates that you're not going to get on on Facebook and Instagram which is how my setup is going and how my my planning process is going like next week this is what I'm going to be doing so you can be looking forward to that that's like the lower the lower tiers in the middle tiers you start getting transcriptions which I have dozens and dozens of original transcriptions of like gaming tunes and my own pieces and some jazz and pop arrangements that I've done and um, I'm, I'm starting to get all of those organized to upload into a Google Doc that just at 25, I think it's $25 a month, you just have access to all of my transcriptions. And um, at 50 and a uh, from 50 to $200 a month, it's like a private lesson package, basically. So if you're a student of mine, then that's Patreon's the way to go because it's gonna, you're, you're gonna pay the same amount that you would essentially for our regular lessons, but you're gonna get additional content um, like videos and, um, all the special like instructions. personalized videos yeah personalized instructional videos and um like this week uh my my big patreon project is to record that video for time lapse that i just played and i'm going to try to make it as high production value as i can right with what i have right. and um but the the goal is to produce is to just produce online content high quality finger style online content with the perspective of a classical guitarist because i tend to, to gravitate more towards um, playing fingerstyle, folk, jazz, improvisa improvisational music, but I, uh, I feel like I have a kind of a unique approach to it. Uh, there are a couple of players out there like Will McNichol and um, who else am I thinking about that has this similar kind of background that we focus, we focus a lot on, on tone quality and um, articulation and counterpoint and uh, changing harmonies and 
theory and all of these kinds of things. So I'm really excited to dive into that with, with people who are also interested. And this just, Patreon is really exciting for me because it feels like the, the community that I've been looking for, you know, one that we, we can all kind of agree that fingerstyle guitar and classical guitar meet pretty, pretty beautifully uh, if, if we approach it properly. And I'm not saying that I have a proper approach, but I think, I think it's going to be interesting to explore it a little bit. So yeah, yeah I mean, I think the, the, the division between them is, is a little bit blurrier than people maybe realize, you know, like, yeah. So, and I just think good music is good music. If you're trained as a good guitarist and, and also to understand the structure of music, you can make great music, right? So yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. I mean, we, st we spend so much time studying all of these great composers and all of these great songwriters and pop artists, jazz artists. We spend all this time listening and playing their music and it's just really fun to kind of take what they've done and, and, and turn it on its head and do something of your own with it, you know? Cool, awesome. Uh, Ruel more or less also says Neapolitan ice cream chord. The Neapolitan <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, the Neapolitan chord. <laughs> Flat two, okay. Gotta love um, it. Oh, and while we're on the topic of like Patreon and stuff, I should mention that I have um, a Patreon and also a PayPal link in the um, description if you want to support the show and donations through the through the PayPal link will be split with the artists because you know this show is around to um, be f to help all of us and uh, create a platform for multiple artists so if you want to support Jacob and also support what I'm doing you can check those out and rise support says, this man I think this is where you're at right yeah 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 and also rise says good music is good music amen indeed less division is better although categories are useful also um, categories are useful too yeah, uh, yeah to an extent for sure okay we're gonna play classical guitar would you rather or just guitar would you rather i guess yeah let's make it happen given uh given your your our current our current situation current here situation. so uh would you rather play a concert when you haven't slept for an entire day or would you rather eat a super hot chili pepper that you can't handle right before you go on stage <laughs> uh Number one, because that I've done that a handful of this times. This is what everybody says. I guess guitarists just don't sleep. Everybody says, yeah, I've totally played with no sleep before. I think I think I would say number two, because I, I feel internally that I'm more ambitious than I I thought you would pick the chili pepper, because I feel like you're the kind of person who's like, there's a food challenge, I'll do it, you know? Yeah, I am. Like, I would yeah. definitely, like, I recently have upgraded from, like, jalapenos to Thai dragon chilies, and I've started making hot sauce, and I'm like, trying to i'm like trying to boost my spice level a little bit so that sounds like an appealing challenge but like i think i'm more likely to make it through a concert on the no sleep question is would it make your cross string trills spicier <laughs> yeah it would <laughs> that's the question it'd be so spicy um okay would you rather sight read a concerto on stage so like you have to play like the ponce concerto or something but you've never played it before and you have to sight read it with the orchestra there and the conductor or would you rather go on stage and play it completely perfectly, no mistakes, best performance of your life, but you like shit your pants really noticeably? <laughs> number two. Number two. Literally number two. I would I would literally shit my shit my pants in front of an audience and play it note for note, and yeah. and take the humor with me, but say yeah, but that guy really killed it. Like That's he really. Good, yeah. He took it in stride because if there's one thing that I know about myself and a part of the reason I'm, I'm going the composer route is because I'm a terrible sight reader. I have never been any good at it. And if I had to get on stage and read a super advanced piece of music, it would just be devastating and nobody would remember it other than that, that guy who did terrible. If I played note for note and they were like, yeah, he also shit his pants and it was hilarious. Like, I don't know. I would right, go yeah, for yeah. It. It's, the, it's a weird <laughs> it's paradox, this but... question where it's like the professional thing is to play really well. But shit yourself, which is not professional. So it's a, it's a, it's a weird scenario. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's not only is it not professional, but that's like, that's yeah. pretty low. Yeah, that's, that's pretty low. But if you do, like you said, if you do really well, people are going to be like, wow, he pulled it off, <laughs> you know? Good for him. Shit his yeah. pants and played perfectly. Nobody's, nobody's ever done it. And no. I don't think anyone's going to assume that it's, out of, that's like, you wanted to do that. Like, it's obviously out of your control if that happens. Yeah, right. So. Okay. Good question. This is good. Um, good questions. <laughs> If you had to learn and memorize in a one week for a performance, so like pretend you've never seen these pieces before, maybe you, okay, you've heard them, you can bring your knowledge of like what you remember from hearing them, but you have to like start learning and perform them in one week. Uh, would you rather learn the Britain Nocturnal or any Bach suite of your choosing? The Britain Nocturnal for sure. Okay. I feel like that's yeah, an easy one. Yeah, Bach is, is beautiful, but it's, 
I have a painful memory with Bach. I learned the PFA, the BWV 998, in my undergrad. I started my sophomore year. I failed my jury with it in my junior year. And I came back and played the full thing my senior year and just didn't do super well with it. So I had like three years of pain with one Bach piece, and I've just never come back. So you're like, it's not happening again. I'm not doing it. Yeah, like, screw that. I'm done with it. That's fair. And plus, I love that. I love the Britain Nocturnal. I, I love Bach, too, but the Britain Nocturnal is like way more my, my sonic speed, you know? Okay, way more your, your style. Okay, cool. Uh, would you rather play a concert with a very small audience that really appreciates what you're doing or a huge audience that doesn't respond very much? Is like not I've always much. had better experiences with the first. Okay. Like, I've even played concerts with, like, four people or three people in it, but every one of them, we came up to each other, we talked to each other, we were, at, we were there for a long time after the concert ended, and we were exchanging numbers, and we became real good friends, and I still talk to some of these people, and... Um, even even concerts of like ten to twenty people who are who are listening to like the purest sound of this amazing guitar, they're they're here to hear me play, but they're also here to hear the intimacy of the the just class instrument that this is. You know, they they hear they hear everything as it is, and then again after the concert we all get to talk about it, and it's it's just a very intimate experience. I've always felt that playing smaller concerts with more engaged people is is way more satisfying and gratifying. Plus, Plus, big big crowds are super nerve wracking, right? Yeah. Sometimes a smaller audience too will just like follow you more and become more of a dedicated audience in a way. So. Right. Yeah. Totally. It just depends, but. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um. Do you want to play one or two more pieces, Jacob? Just because it changes my planning a little bit. Tell me what you're. Yeah, thinking. dude. Yeah. Um. Maybe I, I just think do about one this. more because it's already we've already been doing this for a couple hours. So. Is it two hours already? Yeah, I think so. Dang. All right. Wow, that was fast. It's been fun. It's been super fun. Um, let's do one more question, the lightning round, and then you can play something to wrap us up. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm curious about what you think of the future of guitar. I guess you probably aren't going to want to speak about just classical guitar, but like, I don't know, solo instrumental playing in general. Like, what? Where is our instrument going? How do you feel? I, I'm thinking a lot lately about the reality of recorded music the fact that like record deals are not really a thing anymore or if they are right. they're not very good usually you pay yeah. to record now <laughs> um, yeah. and like selling music in digital form is like dubious at best you know so what yeah. do you think about the, the future of, of what we do and of like being this is a hard lightning round question because I have so many thoughts on this. So, so I'll try to make it as quick as possible. I think um, uh, last year when I was really trying to push my online presence, I was talking to a bunch of uh, like Candy Rat artists and Fret Monkey artists and a couple of classic like Naxos artists. And I think uh, I was really not terribly shocked by their response in saying what you basically just said, which is that record labels are basically in it for the for the money themselves and they're not really gonna pay you a whole lot in royalties and everything. But I think the the positive to come out of this is that we're getting this really organic growth from the underground scene, which is guitarists like you and I who are who are soloists who are spending hours and hours and hours and hours a day just grinding ourselves to become better musicians uh, day after day who are transcribing new music for others to learn, who are recording new music of a different style for other people to listen to and grow their ears with, and who are teaching um, many different styles of music. And there can be a divide there because so my teacher says this, my teacher says this, this transcription says this, and it can be a bit chaotic, but I also feel like we're all beginning to at least I, I'm finding in my in, in our communities that I, I think a lot of us are very open-minded to learning from each other right now. And because of that, I feel like the business of music is going to become much more independent, which is really exciting for me because I'm kind of an introvert and I like staying at home and staying in my bedroom and playing music and transcribing and, and learning new things and putting it out at my own time. And yeah, obviously, like we, we need to make an income, and, and teaching is a great way to do that. But um, I I feel right now that just because of the world that I'm in, um, transcription is, is such a big deal right now because so many guitarists are looking for new music to learn. And even though there's an abundance of it out there, there's 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 always more. There's always more to learn. I mean, half and my job as a teacher is transcribing like whatever my students want to learn. And actually, yeah, I'm sure totally. the notation makes sense because like I mean. 
I'm not actually against learning things from tabs if you can like still understand the rhythm, the rhythm, the harmony, the articulation, and what notes you're actually playing. So I teach everyone to read music who's my student. Like I, mm-hmm. I'm very serious about that. I'm like, you learn to read music, but then if you play a tab, it's fine. We just make sure that we understand the structure of the music that you're playing. But that also exactly. involves some transcription. So I, f- I find that I'm teaching not, I'm not just doing this transcription myself. I'm also, in some cases, depending on the level of the student, teaching them to do basic transcriptions yeah. of like yeah. rhythms and stuff. Cause I'm like, a lot of this stuff that's written down is like really not very precise. And it's yeah. not that we have to be super precise to be right all the time, but it's just like, if you want to achieve the effect this musician is achieving on their, their track when you're playing it, like when you're doing a cover of it. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I understand that a lot of pop musicians and jazz musicians and even classical musicians will just put out a transcription like 10 minutes and be done with it. And it's not super precise, but it gets the job done. It kind of leaves it up to the artist to make something out of it. But I feel that it's almost like you were telling me about this, this podcast or this uh, show that you're doing is like, Two and a half hours is a lot of time to hear somebody talk about music, but it's always a reference. It's always there. You can you can cherry pick. You can go. You can watch the whole thing. You can digest as much as you want. I feel the same way about transcription. The details are always there for you, but you can you can ignore them at first if you want. But if you feel like you want to get a deeper experience of um, a certain piece of music, it's better to have um, an incredibly detailed uh, ledger that shows, that tells you exactly what to do. So as far as as far as the general future of, of the guitar, I. I am encouraged right now. I was pretty discouraged there for a couple of years when I released my album because I'm like, how am I supposed to make money off of releasing or recording, right? Spotify doesn't pay you anything. Yep. Record labels aren't going to do anything for you. CD sales are, like, they're just well, so bad right even now. Even with something like, I don't know, I don't want to say names, but with certain record labels, okay, maybe if you win a competition, you get a free CD recording. Mm-hmm. But even for people who are high profile, I'm not going to drop names, but I know people who are, like, a big deal within the classical guitar world who have been told, like, we'll record your CD, but you have to like fly here, pay for your hotel, pay all these costs up front. So even if you don't have to pay for the recording, which you often do now have to pay for the recording, you have to pay all this other stuff up front, which makes it like, in the end, why not just hire a good audio engineer in your town, be in control of the production of it? I guess it is a lot of work to put it out of there and like, you know, make the album art, make sure you got all the rights, all this stuff. It is a lot of work. I did it for my first CD. Yeah, Um, me too. But at the same time, like Toma Villato, for example, is recording all, um, all of his, um, all of his CDs are recorded by himself, and he releases them himself and puts them out there. And I mean, imagine like the, the the work he has to put into like learning all the software and all the technology. There, that's a real thing. But once you yeah. learn that, like, you are circumnavigating the whole rigmarole of all these other things you pay for. You know, so I don't. It's a real. And I think that's there. so. I think that's so healthy. I think it's so good for individuals to learn how to record themselves and to, like you said, learn learn the ropes and learn how the music business works on their own because it provides a little bit of healthy healthy competition. It's like when you go to uh, Chinatown in any city and you see dozens and dozens of markets that have basically the same thing. But because of that, it's all good product and it's all competitive, competitively priced. And it's it, I feel similarly with... Um, all of us learning how to do all of this stuff online. I think it's obviously COVID is a terrible situation, but we have this blessing in disguise where we have time to learn something new about our business. Right, yeah. and I mean, I've improved I, yeah. my like home studio so much. Like, yeah, I'm so looking forward I've to doing that too. Technology. I've learned new editing software. You know, there's just there's a lot of it's a lot of parts of it that have ended up being somewhat positive, which means hopefully when I go back to performing soon. Um, in yeah. person that I you know have some of these things at my disposal for sure well you have them to push your music out there right because I think the hardest part that they don't really tell you in, in the conservatory is how, how do you run a business right how do you how do you conduct yourself in sort of the, the real world I guess like how do you, you you can make quality music but how do you no, but I mean, get it out there and how do you get people mean, to listen to it doesn't mean a thing if you don't know how to market it like it's just it's so frustrating man I'm, but it's I'm so good that we have this time to learn this um the second masters i'm doing in master i'm really impressed there's there's some problems with the school but i'm really impressed that they have a course on your art as a business that's mandatory through both years of the masters and like a lot oh, of the really? stuff that i already learned on my own but like the fact that that course exists should exist everywhere like that should be a basic yeah, thing totally um sorry rural morales says ah tab touchy subject Standard notation for classical and jazz, not needed for other genres, IMO, but reading rhythms fluently, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say is like, I don't think, like with my students, I don't think standard notation is, is necessary for 
reading all the music they play. But as a teacher personally, I feel it's necessary to teach them so that A, they can communicate with other musicians. Yeah. And B, they understand at least in the first position what the notes they're playing are so that if they have to yeah. reference a chord and know what's in the chord, they can say, oh, this has a G in it. This has an F in it. Because then when I explain basic theory to them, like triads and stuff and sevenths and everything, I actually have a vocabulary to do it, you know? It's so, I, I agree with that so much because I, I write all of my, I transcribe all of my own music in standard notation and taps, but I make sure to focus really heavily on detailing the standard notation, make sure the voicings and the stem directions and everything is really well set. Yeah, then because then you just look up, I, you know? Yeah, yeah, and you can tell what you're supposed to articulate or like what's melody, what's bass, because if you're just looking at a big sheet of numbers, even if the numbers have the stems on top of them that tell you what direction to play, there's not there's really little room for um, articulate d uh, direction, and I also feel like there's nothing more frustrating to me than or or tongue twisty. I guess I should say it's not necessarily frustrating, but tongue twisty when I'm trying to say okay, place your first finger on the second fret of the third string, and then put your second your third finger on this. I'm just saying oh, so many. Oh yeah, I hate here. this. Like when I watch like, these, just put your second finger on an A. Like that's that's so nice. It's so yeah. nice to have a student that can can do that. And you know, others it's 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 good too. But like yeah, it's. To, to know standard notation, I think, is incredibly helpful on the yeah, guitar. Yeah, and again, it's not for the sake of reading, because tabs are super useful for reading. And for my students who play, like, a lot of, like, fingerstyle or rock or pop or metal, like, I have a lot of students playing, like, I have a student playing seven string who's playing, like, Fear Factory and this kind of stuff. And, like, she, you know, with her, it's, like, she's reading from tab, obviously, because she's playing, like, thrash metal on a seven yeah, string guitar. for sure. But, like when I have to explain a rhythm, when I have to explain, okay, but here you have like an F going to an E, which is like a minor second, so it has this very dissonant sound, you know, like, yeah, I have the vocabulary to do it because I know she can read music, right? Actually, she learned to read music before me, but the point is, I make sure that all my students have that basic ability, because otherwise I don't, I can't communicate like the structure of music, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I, I think tab is a very useful like shortcut for reading, but it, mm. it it's very restricting if that's the only language the student has. Yeah, it needs to go in tandem with standard for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I feel very strongly about this. I feel like I'm ranting, but no, I do too for sure. I mean, when I was transcribing my first album, I was asking everybody I knew, like, should I just transcribe all of this in standard notation with score to Torah? And they're like, don't do that, man. Score to Torah for those kinds of tunings and that kind of playing is just so confusing. I, I, but I, mean, I would like, even classical pieces like well, classical, I guess. I mean, the the Korean Baba by Domeniconi, he has the two staves. So one is like in the weird tuning, and one is in standard. Yeah, the same with Shadow Prism. You know this piece I play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it has two dude, staves. I the it. first stave is like sounding, and the second stave is playing, which is really useful because to read the playing one is way easier. But then if you have to check what a note sounds like, you can actually see what it should, the pitch should be. The relationship between the two notes, and yeah, yeah, I see. So sometimes yeah, we man, need two staves. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I appreciate having them both, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, cool. Well, now that we've like bored everybody with our like tab and notation like arguments, um, we're gonna play the lightning round really quick, and then you can play a final tune for us, Jacob. Deal. I, I still gotta decide what I'm gonna play next. I don't even know, but we'll do the lightning round. Okay. Uh, oh, um, and then after the lightning round, I want to ask you one other question. Sure. Um, lightning round. Okay. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Okay. Bogdanovich or Brower? Bogdanovich. Protest the hero or animals as leaders? Protest the hero. Wow. Wow. Bold. Um, Scarlatti or Bach? Scarlatti. Ah, vanilla or chocolate? Vanilla, chocolate. <laughs> which which Scarlatti sonatas have you played? I haven't played any of them. I just love listening to Scarlatti. Uh, I think it's lighter okay. music. I think it um, just it makes my ear happier. Nice. Bach is like an, it's incredible music, but it's like it takes a little bit of work, you know. Yeah, it's pretty heavy for sure. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask? Ocarina for sure. What? We can't be friends anymore. Um, I haven't I haven't beaten Majora's either okay we're just gonna move on uh, <laughs> Mary or Pippin oh uh, I like Pippin okay solo or chamber solo mammals or reptiles ooh mammals beer or wine beer uh, bless the fall or the divorce Prada <laughs> bless the fall what come on man Dude, I had so many of their shirts, so many of their hoodies. My biggest view count on YouTube is four videos of shitty Bless the Fall covers, and they all have like 25k views. And all of my original shit has like 100. Yeah, like, yeah, it is yeah. ridiculous. 
That's you know? how it is, yeah. It's always like you Yeah, and it's from like 10, 12 years ago or something. Some like shitty emo, emo, uh, screamo. Yeah, it's just like. Thing. That's all it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, pizza or pasta? Ooh. Uh, uh, pass. I can't, I can't, I can't choose. <laughs> you can't choose. I love them both so. Uh, list or Chopin? Ooh. Uh, list. Okay. Really? Wow. Okay. We're yeah, I like, I like the intensity. Free stroke or rest stroke? Rest stroke. What? I don't like rest stroke. I mean, I like rest stroke. I like rest stroke. Uh, a lot of the tunes that I played today have like sparse rest strokes. Uh, free stroke free stroke is amazing because it's quicker and easier, but I with this textural kind of music, I need rest stroke to like punch my music out there a little bit more. Right, yeah. yeah. Schubert or Beethoven? Schubert. Yeah, me too. There you go. Nice. Uh, breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Contemporary or classical romantic guitar repertoire? Contemporary. Contemporary, yeah. Easy choice. South Park or The Simpsons? Yeah. South Park. South Park. I love South Park. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, man, I haven't watched it in so long. I gotta go back. Now's the time. Me too, yeah. Campanella or regular scales? Campanella. I, recently, anyway. I've been yeah. obsessed with it. I love Campanella scales. I'm doing, like, I'm playing Carlos' um, arrangement of the Chacon. And there's oh. all these like cross string scale sections he wrote. It's really cool. So beautiful, man. I love the way they sound. Uh, Soar or Giuliani? You know what? I think I like Soar. Nice. Oh, I studied Soar for a long time. We have a yeah. submission for the lightning round from Crash Course for the win. Devin or Matt? No! Devin. Devin. Oh, sorry, Matt. <laughs> I love you too, Matt, Matt, but you know, Devin. Uh, okay. Well, a few more benefits there. DPS or tank? Tank. Tank. Oh, really? Well, okay. We should play ESO together because then I, I, I prefer DPS classes, so. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, like I said, I just finished Ocarina last night, so yeah. I'm going to have a little bit more gaming space to like get ESO on my, on my radar, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sweet or salty? Salty. No, ah, uh, sweet. Uh, no, no. Uh, I'm, gonna uh, say, I'm uh, just going to uh, stick with salty. Okay, tremolo or scales? Tremolo. Tremolo. Sweet picking right hand. or hybrid picking? Sweet picking. Well, hybrid picking involves like uh, multiple fingers, right? Uh, it involves like a pick and like picking with the other fingers. So sweet picking is with the pick, like, you know, but then hybrid Yeah, well, I would say I would say probably hybrid picking then because I use a lot of arpeggios that go up and down with my, my fingers, right? I don't actually use a pick, but right, hybrid. Yeah. Rodrigo or Tedesco? Hmm. Tedesco, I think. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Devin says, haha, take that, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Love okay. you. Uh, Nord or Dunmer? Nord or Dunmer? Dunmer. Dark Elf. Dunmer. I don't know. What, what are these things? You play Skyrim, don't you? You said you were playing Skyrim. No. I never played Skyrim. What? Who, okay, I thought I was talking to you and you said you played Skyrim. Never mind. Okay. That's okay. On. I'll just say Nord. Nord. I don't, I don't okay. know. I'll just say it. Concert or Masterclass, if you're the one giving it? Um, lightning Round. Lightning Round. Masterclass. Nice. Uh, restoration of the composer's intention or personal interpretation? Composer's intention. I think that's changed for me, too. Wow, I did not expect that. Okay, Bream or Segovia? Yeah. Bream or Segovia? Bream. Nice. Bream every day. Uh, yeah. Mountains or beaches? Mountains. I love climbing a mountain, man. Yeah, so, I was, so I was excited going through your summer. profile to find pictures for the cover photo, and I went to your cover photos, and it was all like mountains. I was like... Dude. <laughs> well, I lived in the Midwest for 20 years of my life. It's beautiful, flat, like rolling corn hills. It's amazing, but like... When you get to the, the P and W up here, it's yeah. just like the mountains are just completely mind blowing. It's Pacific crazy. Northwest, yeah, for sure. I miss that area of the world for sure. Yeah, the well, you're pretty close the to. The Netherlands is also a bit flat. Is it? I it's don't like actually know. Flat lowlands like marshy, swampy canals. Uh, well, aren't, aren't you close? I don't, how close are you to like? I don't actually know exactly where you. are. How close are you to the mountains? Well, like I could get down to Switzerland on like a day of trains. Okay. Yeah. But it's like. A lot. I don't know. I also, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. To be fair, like distances in Europe seem further to me now than they did when I first showed up here. When I first Definitely. showed up here, I was like traveling. I'm I was I'm living in Utrecht and I'm traveling to Maastricht for school. It's like two hours each way. I go there like twice a week for that. Well, not anymore because coronavirus. But all the Dutch people are like, "You're crazy." 
two hours. Can you imagine, like, being on the train for two hours? And then in, as a Canadian, I'm like, that's fine. It's like... Yeah, yeah. Vancouver. It's like you just go from Burnaby or Marple up to UBC. It takes, like, an hour and a half. It's exactly. Fine. You're like, that's just, like, my morning commute. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. my my sense of distance is different now. Like, I'm, I've been in Europe long enough that I'm starting to feel like, wow, like, a four-hour journey, that's, like, that's a lot, you know? That's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I always really found that it's crazy how, how compacted Europe is. Like, you can get from country to country on a train, and it's, like, no problem. Yeah, it's, it's a weird mm. concept as a Canadian, for sure. Yeah, um, or even American, I guess. Um, yeah, okay. it's huge over here. Too big. Ravel or Debussy? Ravel. Nice. Uh, Zelda or Pokemon? Zelda, 100%. Ooh. Both, but Zelda. Both, but Zelda. Okay, that's not part of the game. But okay. uh, Martin Dilla or Zoran Dukic? Oh, Dilla. Okay. Cool. Okay, let's hear yeah. your last. Uh, what, are, what are you gonna perform for the end of the stream here? I don't know, man. Uh, I actually didn't plan past that last one. Um, well, you don't have to play something. I mean, we can just talk. I will. I'm happy to. What's a uh, What's a mood that you're feeling? And I'll see if I can capture it with what uh, I got. Going. I think you should play something upbeat to finish. Upbeat. Oh. Yeah, maybe first do your customary like extra tuning. You know. Jacob tunes his guitar for five minutes. Watch, watch Jacob tune his guitar for two hours. Yes, while Jacob is tuning his guitar, everyone, please like and share the stream. <laughs> check out my Patreon. Check out Jacob's Patreon. It's all in the description. <laughs> Just gonna shameless self plug while you tune. Hey, there's there's no shame. No shame here. No shame. I mean, this is the thing. I'm spending a lot of time on this online content, so I shouldn't feel bad. Yeah, it's weird though, man. I mean, when I first got on Instagram, I was just... It's weird. So, yeah. like, so... It, it was really hard. I don't know. It was, like, really hard to just, like, say good things about yourself when you're, like, constantly... Especially as, like, a musician who's picking apart your practice all the time. You're like, this is pretty good, but this and this and this. But yeah, I this know, that is was, pretty was good, but I'm still working on, like, uh, fixing this, you know? Yeah. Sorry about that buzz note at 42 seconds. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Who cares? Just remember, this is a practice video. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, yeah. but I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Uh, yeah, I have found that that turns turns people off. Yeah, so I have tried yeah. stopping. People people are always annoyed because they're like, "Well, it sounds good to me." I mean, that's how I feel when other musicians say that stuff. So. Oh yeah, it makes everybody uncomfortable. I mean, we get it, but it makes it makes us uncomfortable. We're like, no, dude, you sound amazing. Like, you're so good. It's yeah, all good. don't worry about it. Um, but For whatever it's worth, Mike, I think you're an incredible player, and I think that you're doing a good thing here. Oh, thanks. Thank you. You too. Um, Matt says, can Devin perform headstands between sets? <laughs> <laughs> She'll just open up this door back here and just just pop up in the background and just rise up. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, do, on her head. That'll Maybe. be in the next music video. Yeah. You should you should involve, like, you know, some kind of, like, yoga gymnastic thing with your music. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Actually, that's cool. a, that's a really good idea. We have yeah. so many ideas, man. There's so many content ideas. It yeah. just takes time, man. So many ideas. Okay, so what's the piece you're gonna play? This is a piece I wrote called "Cautious Reactions." Um, do you do you ever hear about the band Demira? No. It was just some band from Brooklyn, New York, that one of my buddies, who is not like a music Brent McLean, if you're watching, this is for you. Uh, one of my best friends from childhood. Uh, we got to high school together. He noticed I started going into my like emo post hardcore phase. And he was like, you should check these guys out. And they weren't actually like emo post hardcore, but they're super duper rhythmic, really bouncy, crazy time signatures and uh, very, very um, rhythmically driven. And um, they have a song called Us In Music. I have the tattoo right here to go with it. And I named, I did two pieces called Logistic Thoughts and Cautious Reactions. And it adds up to about 13 minutes of music. I'm not gonna play the first one, um, but I'll play the second one for you. And it's been one of my favorite pieces to play like every single concert I play it, it, it gets pretty good feedback. So I'll, I'll close out with a banger, uh, what I think is a banger. And um, yeah, that's called Cautious Reactions. Awesome, cool. I'm looking forward yeah. to hearing it.
beautiful. Thank you. Nice. Awesome. Good way to end the show. Thanks, thanks, man. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been great. I really miss um, hanging out. I miss our days in Vancouver. I mean, I love yeah, where I am. Come now, back. But Vancouver will always have a special place in my heart. Yeah, I mean, there, there are pros and cons, but a lot of pros. Mostly, like, it's good good people here. Yeah. We miss you over here. Come back. Yeah, I will. Well, they're supposed to come back this summer. But Yeah, I remember. COVID-19. Um, Ruel Morales is bravo. Indeed. Bravo. Oh, thanks, Ruel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so just so everyone knows, you can tune in, tune in again on Friday. Um, at 8 p.m. CET, I'm gonna have Renee Iskierdo on, who's an amazing oh, nice. virtuoso. Um, can't wait to see what he's cooked up. He's he's a, an amazing guitarist, but also just like an amazing guy, amazing teacher, amazing uh, promoter of guitar, and I mean, he's one of those people who's done so much for our instruments. So yeah, excited yeah. to have him on. Uh, and then next week, let me check my show notes here. Friday is Renee, and then next week is Amy Brandon on the 19th. That's also going to be a little different than the norm in the sense that she is trained as a jazz guitarist but writes a lot of like contemporary contemporary music with electronics. So she does a lot of like experimental oh. kind of like with electronic stuff. And she's going to cool. have uh, – she's going to perform a bit herself but also have some videos of um, her pieces being performed by others. So she's a, a composer and uh, also performer. Um, in sort of like contemporary guitar uh, world. Um, and after Amy is Joel Thompson, another Vancouver. Yeah, guy. Joel. Yeah. And I think Joel's going to play some Ponce and Bach, if I'm not mistaken. Cool pairing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Renee, Amy, Joel, everyone tune in 8 p.m. Friday, Tuesday, Friday. Um, and check out Jacob at all the links in the description. Listen to his music. Check out what he's doing. Check out the Patreon, etc. Um, before we finish, Rise asking, "Do you know the Zoo Duo, Peter Constant?" I don't know the Zoo Duo. Do you know the know the Zoo Duo? The Zoo Duo? Yeah, never heard of them. No. Cool. Maybe you can leave the link in the description, uh, Rai. Yeah, I'll good. text you about that too. I want to see. I want to see what those guys are about. Sounds cool. interesting. Do you have anything you want to say? Jacob? Uh, thank you. This has been super fun. I'm really, I'm really happy that you're doing this show and you've brought on some really cool musicians and it's, uh, it's an honor that you brought me on. Thanks, thanks. for, thanks it's for having me on. a lot of fun to have. Um, I mean, the best part about this is I get to connect with people. Um, yeah, yeah. We like, it's just so, I mean, it, we miss you over here, man. And it's been, it's been a long time. So it's good to talk to you. Good to catch yeah. up and nerd out about music and Zelda. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. That you gotta do it more question. regularly too. So you, oh, Rai says they're in the Netherlands. Okay, well, I'll look them up. I haven't heard of them, but um, I will look them up, um, especially if they're if they're in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, I might see them sometime. Yeah, exactly. Um, my other question for you, Jacob, was you said that you just finished Ocarina of Time last night, right? For the first time. Yeah, I did. So, what are your impressions playing one of the greatest games of all time? I love that game, man, and I, it sucks because I, I never, I, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that this is the first time I've ever beaten it because when I was a kid, I was like eight or nine and I was too scared to get past some of the temples. I was like, because it's a freaky little game when you're like uh, eight yeah. years old. Forest Temple is a bit scary. It's crazy. Like once you grow up, shit gets real. And then I came back to it as like a 21 year old kid and I was like, well, now I'm just not smart enough. I can't get past the water temple. And right. yeah, the water temple I came back to it seven years later and I got past the water temple surprising with no no real problems so apparently i've grown um you have grown young padawan did you play I the 3ds grown. version though no it was the uh the gamecube special edition that has uh, all it has the pack so it's the same thing as the n64 so it's still the hard and version then, of water table because in the 3ds version there's like a lot more clues and stuff oh nice that's good sorry my that's, cat that's is good. just knocking over everything what's up kitty uh Loki, but then Loki. Loki is he Loki. Gets, Loki gets really crazy this time of night because his his feeding time is in half an hour, so he starts to like climb everything and knock over plants and like do anything he can to get attention so that we'll feed him. Oh, crazy. it's Nehru. Oh, speaking of Zelda, Nehru. Oh, my our other cat is named after one of the goddesses. Oh my god, I'm so happy that you did this. Um, anyhow. But yeah, man, playing playing through the rest of the temples and like exploring the world and just like knowing that there was so much more than there was before. I mean, it's just like a lifelong game for me, right? Like Look. every every decade of my life, I've I've come back to it and learned more about it. What up? Is this Nehru? This is Loki. Hey, Loki. Oh, hey Loki. Oh, he's not happy. He's like, feed me. 
feed it's me. like I need food. I'm gonna starve me. if you don't feed me now. Feed me now. Um, you really. It was sad. Food. I finished it and I was like, kind of sad. The credits were rolling. I'm like, this is the end. This is the end of an era. You know. Yeah, you really need to play Majora's Mask because it's. I'm like, going to. That's. I like Ocarina of Time, but it's not that good to be honest compared to Majora's Mask. It's well, is Majora is like a pressure cooker game, right? You have to finish it in a certain amount of time, right? Well, okay. The thing is, like, it, there's a there's a t three day timer, so every three three days, but the day the, the hours are more like ten minutes or something. Like it's like, right, right. It's not doesn't correspond to real time. But after every three days, the moon crashes into the earth, killing everybody. So yeah. you have to reset the clock. But in order to reset the clock, you have to get I think through the first dungeon. So within the first three three days of gameplay. You have to beat the first dungeon to get the ability through the ocarina to like reset the clock. But right. every time you reset the clock, you lose some progress, but not all progress. But that's what's okay. really cool. Like you lose non-key items, and you lose certain progress within the game. But every time you beat the dungeon, you get another key item. So basically, every time you reset the clock, you have to try and get the next key item before you reset it. Oh man! And then there's that other like. Cool, but it, it sounds stressful, but fun. It's cool because there's like it's a very cool mechanic because there's like things you can collect that you have to keep in your inventory. It's just, yeah, it requires a lot more strategy than Ocarina. So I have that one. That one's coming up next. I'm really, because I used to play it and I just didn't, I didn't really get it. I wasn't able, I liked the masks that transformed me and I thought it was kind of fun, but I was never able to figure out how to get past whatever it was that I couldn't get past. But um, yeah, have I you would, played a... I would advise you to not shy away from using guides because it, I know using guides feels like kind of ruins it, but with Majora's Mask, it's just very complicated and the the mechanics and the story especially like all the storylines that happen within the game are great without the surprise of how to get the next thing you know like you don't yeah need to... yeah i get that and like have you played um breath of the wild yet not yet i need to i'm working on twilight princess again so see i haven't even played twilight princess yet i haven't played any of the new ones because i don't have the consoles for it yeah too broke <laughs> yeah yeah i don't have like a switch or anything i jessica got me a wii u for my birthday like a used wii nice because it was like it was on sale actually one of my students was getting rid of it because they had the switch oh for christmas sorry oh, nice. um so yeah so that's how i've been playing twilight princess but anyways zelda but yeah zelda it's it's like it was so crazy to finish that game last night because i've never beaten it before but i've spent so many years just like being in that world and now i finished it and i was like okay well this is uh this is the end. This is the, this is the end. It's only the beginning. Yeah. Majora's Mask next. <laughs> yeah. Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess, Breath of the Wild. I have a lifetime of gaming ahead of me. Skyward Sword. Don't forget Skyward Sword. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Everyone forgets about Skyward Sword, sadly. What can you do? What can you do? Okay. Well, thank you yeah. for coming on, Jacob. It's been great. It's been awesome talking to you, Mike. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and watching. It's been amazing. And um, please like subscribe to me on youtube follow the channel here and you can find uh future episodes all the previous episodes are also on youtube on my channel so if you go to michael ibsen youtube i should maybe put that in the description actually next time mm -hmm. but if you search my name on youtube michael ibsen guitar you'll find me and you can find my channel and i have a whole playlist of all the previous episodes and this episode will also go on that so if you miss some you can watch the whole thing later so cool yes okay, thanks before, everybody before my cat destroys the living room i better go